Uh, Dr. Eid, topic, APOE4, saturated fat. I am mindful of your, the way you distinguish the Nigerian comparison study. Got that. Um, I remember hearing you somewhere point out that Dr. Gundry, who'd have us all chugging olive oil and eschewing animal fat, um, had not distinguished between animal fat and dairy fat. And I also remember in West Palm Beach, you on one side, Eric Westman on the other, pointing out that a lot of the data that cause us to think we know <laughs> things about this were derived from carb-centric, glycolytic-centric eating. So the, my question is, is there anything that these recommendations are being based on? Is there anything that should cause us, and I've got uh, heterozygous and homozygous APOE4s in my near and dear, um, should we be worried about animal saturated fat at all? Well, I want to say a couple things about that. One is I haven't looked at all the literature. This is really just a starting point. I took a couple of examples that I hear about a lot in other people's talks and that a lot of people ask me about, so I'm just beginning to understand it. So um, if, if this, if, if this turns out to go the way so many other investigations go when I start looking at something, I would be surprised if there's anything to it. It doesn't make sense from right. a, from a biology, biology right. point of view. It also doesn't make sense from an anthropological point of view because ApoE4 is one of our oldest alleles, and so saturated fat is one of our oldest foods. So people with ApoE4, it doesn't make sense that they would be doomed if they consume an ancient natural whole macronutrient. So, but I can't tell you that the, the modern science, um, I, I can't tell you that there's nothing to it because I haven't read it all. Um, but it, so far, I'm not seeing any there there. Thank you. Okay. I was rushing up to the microphone because I didn't want there to be an empty space, but I don't think that's going to happen this afternoon. I have a quick question about lipedema. I think we are all well aware that um, for most people, Ketogenic diets work extremely well, including those with lipedema, in spite of having been told repetitively year after year that it is chronic, progressive, and does not respond to diet. Where have we heard that before? So I don't buy it. I think that we need a little bit more research in this area. And my question for the panel is, are you aware of any other levers or levers within the ketogenic diet that can make a really profound impact on that incredibly stubborn and um, you know, and diseased fat, and does anyone want to biopsy my thigh? Because I'm here, and I would love it if you could do that for me. <laughs> do you want to take a yeah. Yeah. I'll just, uh, I don't know much about the science, but um, to at least uh, Gary Taubes, in his book, Why We Get Fat, discussed some of the genetic depo deposition of fat in different species of human being or different areas that we come from. And coming from South Africa, there's a particular group of people that have a lot of uh, buttock adiposity, despite the fact that they're very lean and they follow a uh, First Nation uh, type diet, which is a hunter-gatherer diet, which is the Bushmen. So to my mind, the, the, the thought that I can have is that some of the, the fat deposition may be a genetic type of fat deposition rather than a dietary accumulation if that makes sense. I'm not sure that helps you, but if that is true, then the methods of removing that are going to be removal rather than dietary, if that makes sense. It's interesting you should say that because, of course, they're saying that estrogen-dominant women are the type that tend to exhibit this, but it tends to get worse after menopause. And that I find confounding. Yeah, I just don't have an answer to that. That was just the observation that I made, and I've taken a lot from what Gary wrote in that regard. If I could come back to APOE4 for just a moment. Um, there has been one study done taking two groups of patients, a, a control who do not have APOE4 and then APOE4 um, patients or subjects, and they wanted to see what effect an APOE4 di um, guided diet would have on, I believe it was, the primary measure was weight loss, and they did not find that a gene-guided diet had any additional effect. Um, so they, they did find that people were more compliant, and so genes might be a good tool, I guess, to scare people in, or inform people into compliance, but they did not find that the APOE4-guided diet led to any 
improvement over the reference group. And there's one other thing I just want to tack on to this with MTHFR, and I don't profess to be an MTHFR expert, but I've been following some of the outcome trials here and there was a fairly large data set analyzed in Asia showing that those with MTHFR mutations actually saw a reduction in stroke after taking folic acid, which is supposed to be toxic for people with MTHFR or, or you know, uh, contraindicated. So I, I think with the gene testing, there, there's a lot that we haven't quite pinned down just yet. Hi, my name is Dawn, and I'm a type 1 diabetic for almost 60 years. Um, I've been LCHF for four years, and my CAC score is 919. <laughs> is there any way I can reduce that? Yeah, calcium scores don't tend to go down, but the question then becomes, well, does it matter? So that when, once you have a calcium score, you've got your snapshot in time. And then the question is, what can you do about it? And, and the, the what you should do about it should no longer be directed at the calcium, but now needs to be directed at the underlying pathology that caused the calcium to be there in the first place. And that's usually the vascular injury and the metabolic syndrome and the lipids, the whole picture. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the whole setup that caused the calcium to be there in the first place. And then you can follow it over time. And I would not expect it to go down um, but what you hope is that it doesn't go up, or that if it does go up, it goes up very slowly. Uh, there's that one study that actually Ivor Cummins talks about quite a bit, where if there's, I think it was a greater than a 15% increase in five years, there was a much worse outcome than those who had a less than 15% increase. So a slow progression is almost as good as no progression, but don't anticipate a, re a regression. Instead, think of it as your snapshot in time and now to sort of double down and really dive into what could cause that calcification in the first place, which is the vascular injury. Okay. Thanks. Hi. So one of the concerns I hear a lot when people come to us for coaching is that the ketogenic diet may be uniquely, some people go with dangerous, maybe less more a less uh, inflammatory word would be challenging for premenopausal women. And so a lot of people come to us with the belief that either premenopausal women don't do as well on long-term keto or that they need to start implementing carb cycling. And I should mention that a lot of the people we work with are also interested in weight loss, so it's very hard to disentangle anything that they're doing, um, you know, disentangling the effects of calorie restriction versus carb restriction. So that's what I'm working with. So I just wondered if you could comment on that from your clinical experience. Why go with ketogenic? You could do low carb, high fat too. And then I, I, I don't think anybody would be calling that dangerous. Right. But also I think that allowing more protein during the childbearing years um, is probably a really good thing. It's just that for women my age, Nature doesn't care about us anymore. And so, so we can be ketogenic to protect our brains, right? We can be ketogenic. Uh, and I just feel really great doing it. But I, I don't know as I would have wanted to do it when I was 30 or 40. Can I say, I love that comment. So say one, one last, uh, perhaps maybe this may be TMI, but I, um, when I was experimenting with ketogenic diets for the first time a number of years ago, um, I, made the mistake of, you know, following some of the scientific articles that recommended very, very low protein, like, you know, 50 mm -hmm. grams a day, and my cycles stopped for the first time in my life. And so that was just not enough protein for my body. That, you know, so that's not healthy in, in my opinion. So um, I think that it's all about the protein during the reproductive years, and of course for children to growing people, um, pregnant women, um, the, the, you have to have enough protein to, to run your body, <laughs> so. Thank you, I appreciate your perspective. Sure. I love ribeye. I'm never gonna give up my cow. Um, <laughs> I'm going to bring up sleep again because if I had to put a list of my number one health challenge in life, it would probably be getting a good night's sleep. I have diagnosed and treated sleep apnea. And by the way, anybody out here, if you're doing everything in your power with good sleep hygiene and whatever to get to sleep at night and you're still not feeling rested, get yourself checked. Do that because there's no drugs or tea or anything in the world that's going to get you a good night's sleep if you have sleep disordered breathing of some kind. 
Um, that said, I have practiced good sleep hygiene. I have eliminated caffeine to the point I'm, somebody will die and it didn't matter and I'm still waking up around three or four in the morning for no good reason. So is it because I'm getting close to menopause? Help, any of you, I need ideas please. <laughs> and I'm an athlete, I'm really tired when I go to sleep. Well, um, at the risk of being strung up, I'll offer some of my thoughts. Um, I have noticed with women more of a predilection as someone, by, you know, by the way, in my own defense, who tends to steer people toward lower carb initially, and that's, my, that's what I revert to at baseline, I have noticed a higher predilection of women. Uh, it might be an amenorrhea, you know, cycling woman uh, who's under too much stress. If we can uh, throttle back her stress and get her on more carbs, I've seen that be helpful. I've seen that same thing for menopausal women or people in general. One of the symptoms I've seen of, of being too low carb for someone's metabolism is fatigue and insomnia. But that's not the only thing. Uh, there could also be inflammation in the gut, and this has been published in a number of trials showing that as inflammation in the gut goes up, sleep quality goes down. And I suffered with this myself when I had intestinal issues, it was absolutely maddening. And, and remember, you can't have intestinal inflammation in the absence of any intestinal symptoms. Female hormones may also require some support, and there are, there's, a, there's a wonderful host of herbs that are adaptogenic, meaning corrective for female hormones that don't require any testing. And I talk about these in my book. And if you're waking up at night, that could be one reason why. Now, if you're waking up in a hot flash, it's a dead giveaway. But what I've observed is sometimes women haven't gotten to the point yet to where they wake up in a hot flash. And they may be just a little bit warm, but they can't even really perceive that. So they're, they're building their way up to hot flashes, but they're kind of in a subclinical hot flash. So you know, those are all things to consider, potentially tinker with your carb intake look into or take steps to optimize your gut health or consider some, I would start with herbal female hormone support since it's so safe, it's not estrogenic and it doesn't require any lab testing to guide. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a good answer. And then I just want to add a little tidbit in here. Um, if you haven't read Chris Winter's book, The Sleep Solution, he sees things from a very different perspective. And um, I did a podcast interview with him, which I thought was fascinating to hear his perspective because it's, we, we get in our brain that we all need eight hours of sleep. And if we don't, something's going to be awfully wrong and we're going to have increased inflammation and we're going to suffer through the day. And there are some people where that just doesn't happen. Now, for, for the average person, yes, that should be our goal, but there are clear outliers. And it may, it may be that your body just doesn't need that much sleep and you can do more harm than good by stressing about it, about how am I going to fix this problem? if it's not a problem. And again, I'm not saying it's not, but if you're making it through the day without naps, if you're functioning at a perfectly high mental capacity, if you don't have markers of chronic inflammation, if you're otherwise healthy, then maybe it's not as much of a problem as, as we sometimes make it out to be. And I know that's not the most popular answer because people want to focus on it so much, but I guess my point is there are outliers that are going to do just fine and we can make it worse by stressing about it. But for the majority of us, forget what I said. <laughs> Just a quick N equals one anecdote. As I, was, I was actually having a lot of trouble sleeping, then I went carnivore and I sleep like a baby now. So it's, it's worth considering if you've tried all else and it's, not, and it's failed. <laughs> Just a, a lifestyle tweak. I use, um, I, I just practice yoga breathing if I wake up during the night and I'm not falling right back asleep. And I, it, it works like a charm for me. I'll just mention <clears throat> that uh, in our study in Lafayette, Indiana, um, we uh, actually used the Pittsburgh uh, uh, sleep questionnaire uh, on uh, and administered our, our cohort at uh, baseline 70 days, one year, and we are collecting, have collected two-year data. We're about to present our one-year data uh, at the CME course held at Columbus in two weeks. And I'll just, it's not been presented yet, but I'll just mention that we found that of the eight different questions, and this is a subjective questionnaire, it was not objectively measured um, sleep with any kind of device, uh, but of the eight different parameters, three of them got better. Uh, duration did not improve, but sleep quality did improve, and, and people stated that they were more rested during the day. Um, so um, what, the, what that means is that uh, um, 
there, there may be some important uh, uh, benefits to a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And I'll also point out that it, it's my experience from most published research that most individuals and groups of patients who are said to be in nutritional ketosis aren't. And that you may not, since this is a signaling molecule, having a little bit of it isn't the same as having an, ad an adequate amount. So 0.2 isn't the same as 1.2. Um, but this question won't be answered until we do a large study in a heterogeneous group of people, men, women, young, old, uh, in a standard st sleep study uh, situation where they're monitored during sleep. Uh, I've got one volunteer in front, do I hear another? Um, uh, because it, this is not something which, you know, subjectively the, the data is important, but really objective data in, in terms of timing of REM sleep and, and movement during sleep and stuff will be very important if we're going to assess what the potential benefits and or risks are uh, to sleep when we adopt such a uh, marked dietary change. Uh, my questions are, can you comment, the, the doctors and the practitioners there, on how you recommend to type 2 diabetics to manage the dawn phenomenon? I have friends who ask me, sometimes I've encountered that uh, in my own personal experience. So that's one question. The second, okay, okay. I'll ask, I'll do it one at a time. Go ahead. It, it's to all of the doctors that practice. I know you have different methodologies or therapies for it. And I just think for the benefit, the people listening, watching. Yeah, so I think one question is, do you need to address the dawn phenomenon? If, if your blood glucose is a little bit higher in the morning, but your area under the curve for the day is still low and your postprandials are under control, is the dawn phenomenon a problem? I think okay. that's maybe another way to look at it. And, and, and we don't know the answer to that question. I guess, in truth, we don't know the answer to that question. But in, ex um, in experience with people who have worn CGMs, the continuous glucose monitors, uh, there are people who have a dawn phenomenon, increased cortisol in the morning, glucose goes up. But the rest of the day, their area under the curve is rock solid. Their postprandials are rock solid. To me, that doesn't seem like much of a problem. Yeah, a couple of comments on that. Did you say type 2 or type 1? Type 2. Type 2. So the first thing is I tell my patients don't test your blood sugar for two hours before you wake up as long as you're not eating breakfast. And that kind of avoids that. But if it's elevated at two hours, you, I'd have a level of concern. Uh, you know, uh, if it's elevated right away, we all have that. You, probably if you test most people on this panel, they're going to have a slight rise. That's part of the diurnal variation. The second thing, just to come back to someone that uh, someone talked about this a little bit ago, the important thing I believe about a, a high, or a pro, eating protein is to protect it with fat. Protein is either going to go down the gluconeogenic pathway or it's going to go toward tissue repair, tissue building, and as a hormone. And I believe that protein's primary role in the human body is for those three functions. And very little is utilized for, um, for gluconeogenesis. If you look at a keto-adapted person, around five to six grams of sugar is all that they have in their bloodstream. That's a pathetically small amount and it requires very little gluconeogenic effort to create that. If, they're, if their protein uh, fat balance is off, more of that protein may be going down the gluconeogenic pathway and it may be elevating their morning sugars, assuming they're very high. And then the second thing about fat adaptation, and it takes at least eight to 12 weeks to get to this point, at least certainly in my practice, is that the liver retains a lot of glycogen, even on a ketogenic diet. Um, and what happens over time is that as your cells fat adapt, they become more able to use ketones as a primary fuel source. And the dependence on that little rush of sugar is less important. So the removal from the bloodstream is less, the glycogen needs are less. And if they're storing less glycogen, they become, uh, um, they have less of that dawn effect in the morning. In other words, you've got to have glucagon, you've got to have a substrate that glucagon pushes into the bloodstream. And if it's just not there, uh, you're not going to see that dawn effect. So you can modify it, you can modulate it somewhat. Okay. Again, not to sound like a broken record, but my blood sugar used to vary between, you know, 70 and 110 every morning, even on a ketogenic diet sometimes. And on carnivore, it's between 70 and 85 every single day. I stopped testing because it was boring. So I don't know what that means. It could just be me, but it was interesting to see. Sometimes it's good to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
quick question on uh, exercise and oxygen, the breathing technique. I've changed my diet uh, many times. Now I'm kind of hooked up on the uh, low carb. Um, <clears throat> I do some exercise, and um, as far as breathing exercises, and it seems like it varies a lot, the sugar. And I want to know if it has the same effect with ketones. And I combine that with um, um, breathing exercise and physical exercise, um, high intensity exercise, slow burn, high burn. If you have any input on that. Nope. <clears throat> I have no research experience in terms of breathing exercise effects on ketones. Um, okay. You know, we do breathe out acetone in our breath, right. but we don't accelerate acetone production the harder we breathe because it's a spontaneous degradation of acetoacetate it's, uh, uh, from the circulating acetoacetate in the bloodstream. Okay. I will comment that moderate intensity endurance exercise in most people will result in a rise in ketone levels. And so in Jeff Volek's faster study with the uh, 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 keto-adapted ultra runners, uh, they started out at 0.6 millimolar um, uh, at, 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 in the morning, and, and they, he had them do this little test where they ran at race pace on a treadmill for three hours, and for these guys, that was running a marathon on a treadmill. At the end, their values had doubled to 1.6 millimolar. Um, so as Jeff pointed out, the longer you run, uh, the, the better your fuel supply, as, which is the exact opposite when you have carbohydrate depletion and dropping blood sugar. Um, but with very high intensity exercise, uh, we uh, are still processing the data from this tank study, but it looks like even a few minutes of very high intensity exercise will drop ketone levels because uh, in that setting, it looks like the body actually uses them faster than the liver produces them. So it differ it's differential response depending on yeah. the intensity uh, of the exercise. I've noted that I'm, uh, I'm gonna monitor my ketones now, which I didn't. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yes. I, I'm going to monitor the ketones now, which I didn't before but my uh, blood sugar goes up 20, 30 points. And if I take a cold shower, really, really, really cold, it goes down about 50 points. And we, we do know that uh, an early response to physical activity is blood sugar goes up whether you're on a high carb or a low carb diet. So, it, it, so the, it's there was a, actually a transient rise in blood sugar in the first 15 to 20 minutes as the body warms up. Just a comment that I've learned from some of my fastidious type 1s is they know exactly how long to spend in a cold shower for a particular reduction in blood sugar. And I, we do believe at this stage, I don't have any data or evidence, but I think that it's cortisol effect. So there's certain things that, uh, especially particularly after a physical activity, um, I've got some runners, some endurance runners that we're managing, or triathletes, that use the cold shower technique. Now, they're nuts because I can't get myself into that kind of a cold shower, but uh, they use that to reduce their blood sugar. Um, some of them have used caffeine. There's a variety of different tricks and tools that my type ones have figured out. I, if you look at my slide, it says craziness du jour, but they, they buy into that and they actually, it's measurable and that's the beauty about diabetes is you can actually measure those, those changes very acutely. So there is definitely uh, evidence that it does drop that and my type one sometimes use that in lieu of a sugar, of, a, of an insulin bolus. Thank you, I, I was feeling really weird, so now you help me feel better. <laughs> Hi. Recently, my grandson was, um, he's 12 years old, but he was just recently uh, diagnosed with autism. And you were talking about, I I'm going to mess this up, exogenous ketones, like exogenous. I knew I was going to mess it up. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something that my grandson could also take and also... Um, Anything you can help me to steer me towards people who have been working with um, ketogenics and autism? Uh, so I, I have a lot of my students, well, not a lot, but a fair, more than one might think, um, are on the autistic spectrum. I don't have any experience working with autistic children, but just uh, very high functioning college students on the autistic spectrum. Um, and I, uh, haven't had any success 
keeping any of them on a ketogenic diet in a college setting. I've recommended it and they've tried it. it just, it's just a hard setting to work in. But I, I am aware of at least one good published study showing that ketogenic diets can be helpful in reducing the, some of the behavioral issues that come along with autism in children. And uh, I think we just we need a lot more studies. I think a ketogenic diet pro properly formulated for, for a young growing person with enough protein um, it has a lot of potential benefits. I mean, any brain condition can potentially benefit from a ketogenic diet, but I don't think we know enough about it yet to give really solid advice. Okay. Um, Dr. Kellerman, with your son, how did you adjust that because he was so young? Uh, he did not take exogenous ketones, but he did take four tablespoons of MCT oil a day, which is very ketogenic. And uh, children, young children are, are exceptionally tolerant of it as a, as a rule compared to adults. I find it really, really hard to go that route with adults, especially if I mean, you're talking four tablespoons. Uh, and I don't want it to push out the nutrients either. Um, but for, for him, it really, it, it worked. And he was uh, pretty much at four, five, six um, ketones, you know, ketone levels, mill millimole ketones. And his, uh, his glucose was always pretty low. It was so consistent. Like, like you said, we just started testing more out of curiosity than anything else. Um, but uh, as far as exogenous ketones go in the setting of autism with children, um, you know, I don't, I'm putting myself out there saying if I was in that mom's shoes, if this was my son, I might try a half a dose, uh, not necessarily put my child on a ketogenic diet, but I'd want to know if, if, if uh, in the morning, maybe after a little bit of fasting, if, uh, if it made any difference in behavior. And if it did, then I would work with a specialist who could really manage this well so that that child had all of the nutrients that they need and all the supplementation. And I think there are some of the registered dietitians that are working in epilepsy. I think there's some crossover, a little cross-pollination there. So that may be a resource for you, depending on where you live. Thank you. And just a few other things for autism that may be helpful. Um, I interviewed Dr. Nancy O'Hara on the podcast. She was a pediatrician, and she's been experimenting with Helminth therapy, which is the polite term for worm. And if you haven't heard of this, it's a, a little bit counterintuitive when you first hear it, but um, a missing member of our gut microbiota may actually be helminths or worms. And they do have an anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory action. And um, there's also been research, uh, I believe, at Duke uh, on the same topic. Um, but Essentia O'Hara says that about 50% of her patients see a positive impact from helminthic therapy, which is essentially administered just like a probiotic. Uh, so I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend starting there, but uh, she's got some pretty compelling uh, data in, in her pediatric practice with about, again, a 50% response rate. There's also some evidence showing an increase, at least in one study, predilection toward fungal overgrowths in autistic patients, which may be why some patients do better on a lower carb diet. Um, and then there's also this issue of, and this is more so something I've seen clinically and is more anecdotal, um, but children are more susceptible to DL lactic acidosis, which is a, a metabolite of, of um, fermentation in the gut. Children are more sensitive to that. And so another reason why they may do better on a lower carb diet or in addressing dysbiosis, of which may include candida. And I've seen a few cases in the office of parents who've put their children on uh, the GAPS diet, which is essentially a high fermentable food, high probiotic diet, which I think is very healthy, but in some children that seems to have initial benefit and then it becomes detrimental. And what I think happens here is the, the, the D-lactic acidosis, which some probiotics or fermented foods will be rich in, and also histamine intolerance. And I've seen a number of cases where we've seen pretty remarkable improvements in behaviors after getting someone on, in often cases, a lower carb diet, pairing that with antimicrobial therapy, and also making sure that they reduce dietary histamine, which would mean getting rid of all the fermented foods, which is paradoxically, um, you know, a paradoxical recommendation. But for these kids who are kind of, you know, toxic with all this histamine, 
which can be a neuroactive um, compound when you get them on a lower histamine diet in conjunction with addressing any overgrowths that can sometimes lead to quite remarkable improvements. So those are a few things to think about. Thank you. Getting back to sleep, um, nighttime leg cramps uh, that can happen. That's what wakes me up in the middle of the night and I'm sure my cortisol um, goes through the roof. Uh, Dr. Finney, you were very great at giving me a wonderful response, but uh, there, I've talked to many women here, particularly, that we have nighttime leg cramps. I don't know if people want to put up their hand if that happens to them. Um, so if you could, again, uh, for the whole audience, say, what do we do about nighttime leg cramps or cramping? <clears throat> so it's uh, been a 40-year about a quest to figure this out. Um, uh, in my training as a house officer, I had some interest in nutrition and, and I had some interest in cramping because I'd also done a fair bit of uh, endurance bicycling while leading a lousy diet and it's always very uncomfortable when you're 50 miles from home and you cramp up. And we didn't have Uber back then. Um, and uh, I somehow stumbled on to um, the fact that in, in addition to maintaining adequate sodium and potassium, balances in the body that magnesium depletion was an important risk factor. And we actually we saw that a lot in hospitalized patients on total parenteral nutrition where in the early days of what we call TPN, you would just plug in one bag of, 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 of two bags of 3% uh, amino acids and 25% uh, dextrose and standard electrolytes and Magnesium and patients with short bowel syndrome and maladaptive syndromes would have terrible muscle cramps And we learned that if we gave them four times the normal amount of magnesium Not 12 or 16 milliequivalents a day, but 48 to 64 milliequivalents a day. We could make those cramps go away and That's then led me to exploring oral magnesium replacement in people like myself who had um, uh, muscle cramps and uh, It's been a, a difficult quest because I don't think that we have the best replacement <clears throat> for oral magnesium because as anybody knows, milk of magnesium is a laxative and any version of magnesium that you put in your upper gut by itself, whether it's you know, um, uh, mag citrate or mag oxide or mag magnesium chloride, they're all gonna have a laxative effect and it's going to exit the upper gut quite quickly. Um, and so the only really effective formulation that I've found is uh, uh, routinely effective uh, was at one point a proprietary mix called Slomag, which is a slow-release magnesium chloride mixed with calcium chloride, where the calcium has a balancing effect on gut motility, and it slows down upper gut action. So the, when you take these slow-release pills, they linger in the upper gut long enough that they're well absorbed. Um, uh, and uh, for uh, two decades, Slomag was uh, very pricey because it was under patent. It's now off patent, and there are two generic versions of that. Um, <clears throat> and I made a <clears throat> pledge not to provide, uh, uh, be mercenary and provide uh, uh, things that might profit me. But in our book, The, the Art and Science of Low-Carb Performance, which is the one we wrote for athletes, there is a chapter nine is on fluid and electrolyte management, and there's a two-page segment in there on magnesium replacement with either this initial slow mag uh, uh, formulation or something called mag-64 or mag-delay, and all of them are, are carbon copies one from another. Um, and uh, uh, I would suggest that uh, you read that uh, segment. Uh, and by the way, I think you can go on, look inside at, at, on Amazon and actually look at that chapter in the book. So you don't have to buy it, you just go on Amazon and click through to chapter nine, uh, and the information is there. The name of the book is The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance. It's by some young, smart, handsome guy named Volek, and then an older guy. <laughs> Even if you can get the chapter for free, you should buy the book anyway. <laughs> But one other thing, though, is to, is to look at magne magnesium supplementation, not just through the oral route, but through the, the dermis. You can absorb it through your skin. So um, magnesium salt baths is another great thing, especially sort of late at night to kind of get you ready for bed and part of your sleep routine, and then hopefully get a little extra bit of magnesium in your system before sleep to kind of prevent those leg cramps. Another quick comment about magnesium is our standard magnesium blood tests are terrible for determining if you're low on magnesium. So if you 
say to your doctor, I'm cramping, they check your magnesium, they say, oh, your magnesium's fine. It's more the cellular magnesium you're interested in than your, than your plasma magnesium, so that's not a great uh, test, so you probably just want to empirically try supplementing anyway. I know there's a, a test, it doesn't always work for people with cancer because of their cell counts, but red blood cell magnesium might give you a better idea of tissue levels. When I, when I travel, I get terrible lug cramps. So uh, every night while I've been here, I use a magnesium cream and I really rub it in deep. So I don't know whether it's the magnesium or the little nighttime massage I'm giving my calves, but um, I'm stellar when I do that. If I don't do it, I'm in trouble. So uh, even though I've been doing this for a long time, I, st I still run into that issue. Um, and yes, I thank you for your extended discussion on that last night. I think just one comment uh, to step back, and Steve mentioned it briefly, is don't ever forget about salt. Um, salt is your intravascular proton. All the others typically, like for example, potassium, 96% of your potassium is intracellular. But when your sodium levels are low, and by definition, everyone that's on glucose has a low sodium level because the human body uses sodium to get rid of water. You don't pee out water, you pee out salt, and the, the water chases the salt. Sugar retains a lot of fluid. For every molecule of glucose, you need a molecule of water. So um, when people are carbohydrate dominant, they typically have a lot of fluid, excess fluid volume. That affects the heart, it affects the blood pressure, a variety of other things. And the only way the body mechanistically can get rid of that is to pee out sodium. So by definition, obese people are typically sodium deficient. So the very first thing I tell them when they come off carbohydrates is to add, liberally add salt to your food. But the problem is we're so afraid to do that. We think we're going to have a heart attack in two seconds. So you really want to share that with them. The edema, the peripheral edema in their legs goes away, but also from a uh, protonic, for the protons, uh, magnesium, calcium, potassium, are all protons. If there's enough sodium in the bloodstream, you're not leaching them out of your cells to replace the sodium because the body needs that for oncotic uh, pressure in the blood system. So don't ever forget about your salt. And I, I add li salt liberally to my food. And when someone at a restaurant gets upset with me, I add more. <laughs> it's, um, but the human body is designed to use or to, to be able to manage m massive amounts of salt. We've always run at a salt deficit as a species. The salt caravans, the salt mines, we've always chased salt. And every system that these guys use to control blood pressure, almost every system, messes with the sodium metabolism system, the renin angiotensin system. So uh, sodium is an integral part to what we do, and it's in the carbohydrate era that essential hypertension, which I call carbio carbophilic hypertension, has become an issue because of a lack of salt, and we mess with that salt. And for those who are afraid of taking salt because of what we've been told for decades, it's something you can measure. You measure your blood pressure, you change your diet, you start adding salt, and you measure your blood pressure and keep measuring it, and you can see if there's a change or not. There's no question there is a subset of the population who is salt sensitive and whose blood pressure will go up and who will start retaining fluid. But that's a minority, not a majority, as it's been sort of perpetrated over and over. So if you're still concerned, measure your blood pressure and follow it. And again, not to sound like a broken record, but I had leg cramps <laughs> very frequently. I went going over and they went away. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> Hi, um, I've been, uh, uh, for the last three years, I've been living a ketogenic diet pretty strictly, had a little fallout a while back with peanut butter, but got right back on the track. <laughs> and um, my reasons were not just for weight control. Uh, I had a stroke about three and a half years ago, and it took me three months to be able to walk again. There's a slight uh, short in the brain to right leg connection, which affects both my balance and it kind of has a mind of its own occasionally. So I'm always careful going downstairs because it thinks I want to kneel. And uh, also in my family, uh, my, both parents were always very slim, but there is diabetes on my mother's side, severe diabetes in, with her father and her brother. And uh, my dad uh, in his family has Alzheimer's. And so he passed. My, my, his mother had Alzheimer's, and I want to stave that off. I want to, I don't know what type of repair I can do with this little brain short, but I'm hoping that it gets better because everything seems to be getting better. I've lost 100 pounds, wow. and, and, 
I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled for that progress. Uh, I am hypertensive. I have high, uh, high blood pressure. Um, but I, I, what I've been doing now, not just measuring with the sticks, but I've been using my uh, blood uh, glu, glu, uh, GKI <laughs> to, to see if I can get my, my GKI measurement round one, round two, because I've been reading through Dr. Google uh, that in, for the repairs to start happening, not just the weight loss, that you have to keep that GKI low. And I wanted to know how safe is it for me to try to stay in those low, low numbers um, for repair, for, for diabetes repair. My blood sugars now, I had a 7.1 go down to 5.2. My blood measure, measurements are all, are all like 79, 82, 96. After the peanut butter fallout, it was 1, 126 in the morning, which was like, to me, it was like oh, 126. But um, I'm, I'm still taking one metformin. But, but I, wanna, I wanna really knock it up. I wanna lose a little more weight, but mostly I wanna stay in that, that repairing zone for my, my brain and maybe to help the blood pressure. I sort of, I'm sorry, I sort of missed the blood pressure part. I heard more about blood glucose. Oh, well, so. I, ha I have high blood pressure. Okay. And it kind of remains, it kind of runs still a little high, nothing like it used to. It's like yeah. 121 over something, I don't know. I don't remember at the moment. I'm That's nervous pretty good. talking. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty good. But sometimes every once in a while it'll still go up. But, I, but it has been a lot better. It has been a lot better. Yeah. Um, but So your main question was about blood glucose, if it's okay no, to leave the blood glucose I, on a I, low I level. Wanna get, I want to get my... Uh, uh, glucose ketone index to be around 1.2 between 1 and 2 and I wonder about the safety of staying in that range for, for how is it safe to stay in that range well, I mean Dom Diagostino certainly would say yes no question about that um, I, I don't know how much long-term data there is but um, I don't know that there's a reason to suspect it wouldn't be safe in the long run I don't know if... um, well I, I have certainly no um, concerns about staying in that zone. The two things that you're dealing with, with uh, having had a stroke, is is there peripheral tissue repair that can infiltrate that area and at least diminish the impact of the tissue that died? But more importantly, the one thing you can affect is ongoing risk. And what you've done is mitigated that risk tremendously by what you've done. Uh, there's certain things you can control, certain things you can't. And the one thing, as Steve talks about quite a bit, you've controlled your inflammation, which is really where this comes from. Um, and I think that, that's, that's the best you can do right now. Uh, perfection is the enemy of good enough. And I think as long as you continue this trend, the only other thing that I would try to add in, and I understand your leg, is perhaps uh, uh, increasing physical activity as much as you can as you lose more weight. When you're really fat, it's difficult to exercise. As you lose weight, that becomes easier and more uh, positive. So that's the only other piece that I would add in. I walk a lot. Perfect. <laughs> but I'll, I'll step it up. I, you know, And I, I love moving, so I'm not one of those people that don't doesn't like to exercise. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Oh, I'd, I'd like to say so. I'd like to ask, does everyone here know what a GKI index is? No, what that means? No. Okay. It's, it's the glucose ketone index, and it's something Dr. Seyfried developed for uh, cancer to, to help people visualize what uh, his thoughts on a therapeutic zone are. So what it is is you take the, the glucose number, which here in the States is uh, expressed in milligrams per deciliter, divided by 18, to get uh, a, a millimolar score um, on that measurement, unit of measurement. And then you compare the millimoles of um, glucose to ketones. So let's say you had, um, let's see, can I do the math? 72, let's say it's a glucose of 72 and a ketone level of 2.0. So the glucose at 72, you divide it by 18, you get four. You compare those two, four, to two, that's a two, that's a glucose ketone index of two. Sounds a little complicated, but I think we can simplify it and just say keeping ketones you know, as, um, elevated, you know, looking to, to, to make sure that what you're doing as far as your dietary tweaks is keeping ketones up in a range above you know, 1.5 or two or whatever. For, I mean, I'm just going with what you're saying here. And keeping um, um, an, an eye on your glucose levels. And like you said, don't measure, please don't measure fasting blood glucose once you've been doing this for a while. Wait a few hours. 
and then measure it because just about everybody I work with that goes that route of testing their fasting blood glucose is seeing that, um, that rise, that dawn effect. Um, and, I, and I do believe it's harmless and I don't want people to stress over it. That'll raise your blood glucose level. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Hi. I'm a little hard of hearing and I don't think I'm alone. Could you guys hold the mics closer when you speak? Because some of us are hard. Yeah, anyway. We'll do. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't think it's been discussed during this conference, but I have a concern about the, the dangers or potential dangers of the, the toxins that are locked in our fat cells and what happens to them as we're losing fat and whether this is an issue or a non-issue in terms of losing fat storage rather than losing weight. I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. I, I don't know as we have any really solid science on that. I know that like vitamin D levels rise in people who are losing weight extremely rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my goal is not to, uh, when I work with people, I don't really want them losing a ton of weight very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if you're feeling better as you're losing the weight, if you've if you're got less inflammation and you're moving around better and you're sleeping better or whatever, then it's probably not doing any harm to you. Um, if you're feeling really crappy as this is going on, I'd be looking at just sort of managing the the, managing that, maybe slowing down the weight loss and seeing if that makes a difference. And if not, then look, well, I mean, even before you slow down the weight loss, you want to look at things like your electrolyte balance and make sure that you are taking in enough salt um, and possibly other, I mean, I, I take magnesium as well. I think those are really yeah, important. And I use the spray and it helps. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but it's more where do the toxins go and, and if they're stored in the fat, What's happening? That, your liver is a great detoxifier. I mean, it's, I, I want to do a presentation just on liver someday because it, it yeah. really is a great detoxifier. So right. I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of what I hear about liver flushes and cleanses and stuff. Well, I that's said, what let your, they, let you your know, body there's, just there's take care of There's controversy about, about detoxing before or after or during, and I'm wondering if that's just more bogus information out there that's not going I, to help it's, us. Just aim for what is feeling really good Okay. And if it's not feeling good, troubleshoot it then. That would, I mean, that's what I go with. Okay. And re regarding toxins, I'm not sure if anyone here has heard of Brian Walsh, but he, he does some really great work. And, and I interviewed him on my podcast about a year ago, and he blew my mind with the depth of analysis he went into when reviewing the studies on detoxification. And you're correct in, in the criticism that much of the detox field is a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Right? And, and he really quantified that. He has put together a evidence-based program, which is minimal supplements, right? It's not take a $1,000 worth of powders a month to detox. He does recommend some supplements, but a low-calorie diet, I believe 600 calories per day with, with kind of a tail of a, a long-go fasting mimicking diet combined with sauna therapy and a few select agents to help bind toxins. So he has kind of a, a hypocaloric practical detox protocol. If you search the name Brian Walsh in detox, that should come up. Um, and he, he's, um, I think, done a really good job of, in a level-headed way, trying to look at, you know, are these toxin assays accurate? Most of them aren't. Are there some questionnaires that can give you a sense of toxic burden? Yes, which are research validated. And are there any good detox protocols that are evidence-based? Not really, except for a few things, but importantly, one of the things he points out is some formulas that are purported to be detox formulas actually inhibit certain phases of detoxification. And, and so he takes more of a, a clinical outcome and macro view with his recommendations. So something there to potentially look into. Yeah, because there's also the liver issue of, of fatty liver disease and process where it's not functioning the way it should be. So it's, it's sort of like... Yeah, that's why, that's why I said if you're not feeling good, there's probably something wrong with what you're doing. So, um, but I'm, I'm not the expert on fatty liver disease. You've got these folks here. So if I can just jump in. That fatty liver disease is right in my wheelhouse as a surgeon because the worst thing you can do is operate on someone with a fatty liver when you're doing foregut surgery. It's a miserable. Um, this is something over the last 20 years we found a formula for, and it's very simple, for curing fatty liver disease or, or putting it, getting rid of it within two to three days. 
uh, and it's very simple. That number one, the human liver does not store fat. So the fat in the human liver is part of the conveyor belt, and there's a, a differential between the production of the fat, for, usually from carbohydrate, to the shipping of, of it out to the fat cells. Shark liver, for example, is designed to store fat. That gives them buoyancy. Um, but that's a different story. So within 48 hours of a zero-calorie um, diet, so you put yourself on sugar-free clear fluids for 48 hours, you can get rid of the fatty liver. Uh, zero carbs. So just sugar-free sugar -free clear fluids. So what I, do, what I do with my patients, if I've got the time, is for five days I put them on an ultra-low carbohydrate diet. I'll tell them, you can eat a cow a day, you'll be fine. And then for the last 48 hours, I put them on a zero calorie diet. So, because some of the protein will get converted to uh, sugar and glycogen or to glucose and glycogen. Um, so, and I can assure you, both by biopsy and by visualization, they do not have fatty liver. It goes away extremely quickly. So, that's a very, very important consideration. And we've we spent time biopsying over 100 livers sequentially and proving that when we've got ultrasound evidence of a fatty liver 48 hours before and biopsy proven evidence that it's gone. It's, it, yeah, it's correct. It's, it's water. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's water, and some of those patients, when they're not doing this intention... They say they this is being recorded, so don't you want to just repeat the question, please, and ask from the mic? Yeah, so it mind. sounds like water. It basically, for the purists, it is water, but a lot of our patients, from a clinical perspective, if I get someone with bad cholecystitis, I'm going to take out their gallbladder, but I want their liver to be small, and they're not, they don't have a vested interest in this, so I'll give them some of the and I, I know the purists will argue with me, but um, some of the sugar supplements, so the uh, sweeteners. So I'll add sweeteners. Um, I do use broth because I don't want them to get into the headaches and all the other stuff. So uh, salt is an another piece that we use. But that's, that's basically true. So I'm someone who was severely insulin resistant, becoming pretty insulin sensitive at this point, keto for two years, and I'm struggling with, I'm very good at doing a ketogenic diet for weight loss and have struggled transitioning to a ketogenic diet for performance. I see that there's a difference in that for me. Um, and I've, adding protein makes me tired. Uh, I don't know if it's just trying to adjust to different levels. Um, I. I'm someone who couldn't ride a bike for eight minutes when I was 100 pounds overweight to now can ride two, three, four, five hours on endurance stuff. But when it comes to weight training or weightlifting on a, you know, a regular basis, I, I can't seem to get my diet to match my activity level. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Finny? One thing I can say in, in talking to athletes and sort of hyper aggressive testers and very sort of sensitive to their, themselves, some people say it takes a year to really adapt their performance to a ketogenic diet, which sounds like a ridiculously long time. It doesn't really sort of make sense why it would take that long, but I've heard it from athlete after athlete that it can take over a year to really adapt. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. but so time. Yeah, like time, time, and then um, also if you're doing, you know, sort of intermittent fasting or time restricted eating, that can play into it as well. Um, the timing of your food intake to your workouts can make a difference as well. Um, people differ one from another, and um, I don't think there's been enough study of the variation among individuals and how they respond to any one set. Um, dietary intervention, particularly around low carb. Um, so for instance, when I did my study in bike racers, um, where we fed them a, a very uh, strict ketogenic diet for just four weeks, and we put them back on the cycle ergometer uh, at 65% of VO2 max after a month of adaptation, and they'd continued their, their routine training, which was 100 to 200 miles a week. They complained about it bitterly for the first week or two, and then did just fine. But when we measured their endurance to exhaustion at the end of that four weeks, one of them was almost exactly the same as he was previously. Two of them got a lot better, and two of them got a lot worse. The mean that change was no, no change. But for the two who got worse, they felt terrible. Uh, but we re reported it as, you know, in terms of the, in the paper, as the mean, that mean change, but then we showed the individual values. 
Uh, but it could be that some people take a lot longer to adapt than others. Um, and some people adapt differently. And I'll just, in Jeff Volek's absence, because he had to leave, I'll mention that in his study of the ultra-endurance athletes who'd been on the ketogenic diet, an average of two years, and the shortest duration was six months, when they did pre-exercise muscle biopsies, now one group had been eating about 60 grams of carbs per day, and the other group was eating 300 grams of carbs per day. Uh, when they measured the muscle glycogen pre-exercise after an overnight fast, they were identical. And they're both in the high range of what, what, what we did, where we'd expect a carb-fed athlete to be. So somehow the low-carb adapted athletes, their body had learned to become such an effective scavenger of gluconeogenic material that they were maintaining a, a, a quite high, you know, a, a very respectable, let's say, level of glycogen. Um, what that implies is that for a person who's then doing high-intensity resistance exercise, they should have the same fuel supply. But that doesn't mean that your central nervous system response, and, and the, according to Tim Noakes, the central nervous system has as much effect on your ability to do performance as your, your muscles do, and the, and the muscle fuel supply. So um, I would explore your own personal boundaries, you know, the, what, what you find out will be most important for you, your clone, and your identical twin, <laughs> because we vary so much one from another. Um, uh, but uh, if, it, if resistance exercise when you're keto adapted is not the right thing for you, I, you know, be adaptive to some different, uh, uh, you know, you move to more, more endurance activity. We'll stick to what feels good. Yep. Okay. One trust trust thing your is body, not, not a guru like so many of us standing here, <laughs> sitting here. So, so the critics um, of, for a uh, like fat adapted person exercising and saying they're not feeling well, the, the critics would say, well, your respiratory quotient changes, you're burning fat for fuel, you are adapted, and this is as good as it's gonna get. But I think that the research clearly shows that no, even if your respiratory quotient changes and, and your fat burning, it still take, takes time beyond that. Yeah. Just uh, two quick comments. Uh, am I correct in saying that you do pretty well with your endurance type sports, yes. but it's the burst activity sports yes. you're struggling with? Two comments about that. For the uh, I've got a group of type 1 diabetics who are triathletes that live in France. They happen to be women, and we've been managing them. The first thing we did, they were keto adaptive, but their A1Cs were still in the 5.5 five to 5.7 range, and we helped them get that down to the 4.7 to 5.2 range. And uh, they saw a performance improvement under those conditions. The second thing they do, they've worked out that they can take some MCT oil or MCT with their coffee or whatever it may be before a race or before an endurance uh, sport, and it does improve performance. What Tim Noakes is currently working on, or one of his fellows is working on, is burst activity, your power lifter, your sprinter. And at least some of the thought process, and I, I haven't spoken to him for a few weeks about this, but uh, is don't be afraid of adding some carbohydrate into a sprint activity. Because sometimes uh, the, the muscles need that nitrous in the race car, uh, if that makes sense. If, if the fat is your fuel, if that is your, your gasoline, uh, the nitrous may come from, from, from a little bit of sugar. And they're experimenting with that. I don't have the data that, that science is being done right now, and I think that will be out there. Uh, but I think we've swung maybe a little bit, especially in the athletic side, to fear carbohydrates a little bit too much, and there may be some value for them uh, under those conditions. Thank you. Uh, this question is for the whole panel. Have each of you ever engaged any of your elected officials, state, local, federal, to tell them about your experiences with your patients and what you're doing? <laughs> and if not, would you be interested in doing that? This is a real specific one. It's not, a, no, I have not tried to engage the community, uh, community nurse, yeah, our public health nurse, and uh, it, that was gratifying in some level. Um, but uh, when, um, when Ed Kennedy, Ted Kennedy was diagnosed with GBM, um, our state senator, Max Baucus, who is a good friend of Ted Kennedy's, um, was there on a fundraiser and I cornered him and I was still in the proselytizing stages back then and I was just giving him all this information that I thought, he, of course he was going to take this to Ted Kennedy. And you know what? It didn't really work out that way. I have not. But I should. <laughs> yes, yes you should. All of you should if you haven't. Just one comment and I think there's been a paradigm shift and I've 
haven't done it yet, but I'm very vested in the space because when we talk about obesity, which is really what these meetings were about two, three years ago, it was about treating obesity, and I, there's a, a distance that most folks want from obese people. They don't, it, it's like, uh, whereas when you're talking about diabetes, there's a huge vested interest because of the economics of diabetes uh, in, in the measurables in terms of the healthcare system, and there's a direct measurable cost. So I think we're going to have more traction when we pitch diabetes as opposed to obesity. And I, you know, I've worked in the obesity space, I'm very passionate about it, and it just irks me that it's so ostracized, but the diabetic space, people are sensitive to it, uh, people understand it, and there's a cost measurement that's direct. My congressman is a physician named Dr. Ami Berra in California, um, <clears throat> and he lives in my neighborhood, and I see him occasionally. Uh, he's a former faculty at UC Davis, a former colleague, and um, uh, I try to just try to test the waters. But I think his experience is that Congress right now is so toxic that even doing basic things is so difficult that raising something that's like what I do that's outside the box. You know, he he's, likes to have our, our donation every year, <laughs> but you know, I, he, he's kind of communicating that it, it, he did, up till now it hasn't been the right time. Uh, but I'm just gonna keep doing that you know, once every six months or so when I see him at, at random. Um, you know, ask him how you're doing and what you're doing, and I, I tell him, I'm still working on that crazy thing, reversing diabetes in 100 million people. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday we'll believe it. So I think this question is probably for, for Mike, um, but there may be others that, that have some input. I was hoping to hear, and if I was working at the back and I missed this, I apologize to all of you, but it didn't happen to me too badly, but a lot of people that I try to help to get into this diet, um, they're changing what they're eating quite significantly, and so they're um, suddenly the, the, much, the stomach issues are, are really prevalent. And, um, you know, it's, everything basically just goes straight through to, to, to explain it. Um, some people, clear up really quickly, and others, it's much more prolonged. So what's really going on there? Is it like, there's a gut biome that's, that needs to change? And why does it take so much longer for some people? When, did, when does it become dangerous, and, and how, how should they try to fix that? Well, I don't think there's necessarily one answer for all those cases, but one of the things that you will often see, or, or maybe two, when people shift to a paleo diet or a lower carb diet, oftentimes they're eating more vegetables and more FODMAPs. And so if someone has this sensitive gut underlying that may be prone toward IBS or toward IBD, um, then a higher, you know, relatively higher FODMAP diet may really provoke that. And so the solution there may not be a difficult one, eat these vegetables and minimize those vegetables. That would essentially be what, a, and, and fruits, what a low FODMAP, high FODMAP delineation might look like. Something else that may happen less common would be histamine intolerance. And as we start getting into fermented foods and spinach, avocado, cured meats, jerkies, all of these will be high in histamine. And we do know that histamine for some people, especially if there's underlying damage in the gut because the, the villi secrete histamine digesting or degrading enzymes. So if your gut's inflamed, you're a little bit behind the eight ball with your ability to degrade and, and metabolize histamine until you heal your, your gut. So if you then go on a higher histamine diet, you could provoke this. So you can kind of layer this or sequence this starting off with a FODMAP restriction, which for, for many people, a reduction in FODMAPs lead to a leads to a resolution in symptoms, and then you can gradually reintroduce the tolerance. So some people might have a couple of things they have to be a little bit cautious with, but most FODMAPs should be back on the table at least to some degree. Um, and then second to that, consider a, a low histamine diet. The good thing about either a low FODMAP or a low histamine diet is you'll see a response within one to two weeks. 
So it's not as if to say you have to be on this for months until you know you're doing the right thing. You won't plateau in terms of your improvements by one to two weeks, but by one to two weeks, you should clearly be able to say, yes, I'm feeling better, and then ride that until your plateau. Now, if your plateau is at an unacceptable level of improvement, let's say only 30%, or you get no improvement at all, then you may want to escalate to some of these therapies that help to modulate dysbiosis. And probiotics are a great place to start as kind of, you know, I talk about that as step two in the book. And then after that, you could then step three, consider antimicrobials, which are a little bit stronger in that, in that direction of giving the microbiota a nudge. And, and my theory is by giving the microbiota a nudge, if there's, if there's a disequilibrium and you nudge it and you have these healthy diet and lifestyle factors in place, you can then restore this eubiosis. Um, and so... For a lot of people, you know, that will get them pretty far. Awesome. Thanks. The other um, not uncommon problem with gastrointestinal upset when people start out on a ketogenic diet is they haven't learned to, to avoid high omega-6 polyunsaturates. And I actually, the experience in my, the, the bike racer study, and maybe some of you have heard me say this, was we had a, the, the dietitian in the general research, clinical research center was sure that feeding uh, animal fats containing cholesterol was going to kill these young men very quickly. And so, and we could only have five entrees because we had to know precisely how much protein there was that we fed. So everything was weighed and precisely quantitated. So we had uh, one entree that was a chicken breast with a uh, cream sauce, a beef uh, um, ground patty with a stroganoff sauce, and an omelet with cheese, and then a chicken salad and a tuna salad, and they were made with commercial mayonnaise. And she said, you should eat the chicken and tuna salads because they don't contain much cholesterol. Um, because then the mayonnaise, of course, was made with soybean oil. Now, none of these guys, they all were in sequence because I could only get one bed in the GCRC. They not, didn't meet each other. They weren't trading notes. Every one of them within a week stopped eating the chicken and tuna salad. They said, I, can't, I don't feel good when I eat it. And bicycle racers have cast iron intestines, you know. I mean, they eat beef sandwiches riding up mountains um, and survive. And they... And, so what we discovered, and by personally on self-experimentation, and I rarely talk about self-experimentation, but I'll just say, I actually put a feeding tube in myself and fed myself corn oil, olive oil, or soybean oil overnight, 1,500 calories per night overnight for a few weeks at a time. And within three days of running either corn or soybean oil, I was severely nauseated and, and, uh, and you know, on the verge of losing my tube, so to speak. <laughs> Um, and when I did olive oil, it was completely benign for two weeks at a time. And I've met people who said, yeah, I, I, could, I tried that diet. It worked well at the start when I was not eating that much. But as I added more fat, it just really made me sick. And they were using uh, a lot of mayonnaise, commercial mayonnaise, because um, it's cheap and readily available. And it's, it's, you know, it's the best emulsified and rather tasty. So getting people to eat the right kind of fats, which focuses on monounsaturates and, and not limiting saturated fats from... from uh, uh, plant or animal sources is, is the best strategy to avoid that problem. I think, Doug, just a couple of comments uh, in this regard, and I come at it from a clinical perspective. Uh, the days when we used Orlistat and Ally, which were fat blockers, the warning label says beware of fecal seepage, and that's because it blocks fat. And patients with uh, chronic pancreatitis also have fecal seepage because they can't absorb fat. So when you're going from a 10% diet of saturated fat to a 75, 80%, you know, you're massively increasing that, the body takes time to adapt. And really what has to happen is you have to have enough bile to be able to absorb that fat. So um, I take my patients through a journey of conditioning uh, if that's something they're doing. So you slowly ramp it up. You don't just go from zero to 80 in, in one go. The second thing is uh, people that have had their gallbladders taken out, and a lot of our obese patients have had cholecystectomies. They're not able to squeeze a gallbladder and dump a massive amount of bile into the intestine. The bile is still there, but they have to be much slower as well because otherwise that'll happen. Um, the other, the caveat to that is constipation, which we see a lot in our patients in the first couple of weeks. And one of the key concepts about constipation is I add a lot of salt, and I, I'm not a salt fiend, but um, salt helps because it retains fluid in the, in the poop, as well as some of the vegetable, and, and the fiber debate is still out, but salt definitely helps. Um, it, the other thing that when people go and they eat a lot of cheese right away, that tends to constipate them tremendously. So I'll tell them to the constipators, I'll tell them to avoid cheese, and the, those with fecal seepage, I say, increase your cheese content. And it seems to balance out clinically. Uh, it's not the science, but those are, those are some of the things we encounter in clinical practice. And you're right, it puts people off. 
So if they're forewarned about some of those things, they can modify their diet. This question was prompted by Dr. Finney's talk. Uh, my understanding of inflammation is that it's a response to damage or infection. And so if you have a drug or a therapy that is knocking out a specific inflammatory mechanism, one could argue that it's attacking your response and not the damage. Whereas if you have something that initiates a widespread lowering of inflammation across many markers, then it's more suggestive that you've actually addressed the damage. And I'm wondering if you have any other ideas about how you would distinguish whether something that you're doing is diminishing your ability to respond to damage or is actually reducing the damage? Uh, a a well-formulated question for which I don't have a well-formulated <laughs> answer. Um, it's, there is, we tend to differentiate acute inflammation from chronic inflammation. And the chronic inflammation is normally, we, we assume that, that you know, it's normal, some people's values are higher than others. Um, but we're learning that that's a lot more nuanced. Um, uh, and uh, I think I, we heard a neurologist today say that, that uh, certain neurological diseases may actually be low-grade central nervous system infections. Um, and so we can't just say that, well, that's normal for that person. Um, but we do know that chronic low-grade inflammation is itself damaging. It's not just a response to damage, but it is damaging in and of itself. Right. Um, and we also know that certain genotypes are more prone to certain types of inflammation. So there's a company in which I own no stock uh, in Massachusetts called Interleukin Genetics, and they've found uh, combinations of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that lead to characteristic inflammation, for instance, in, in the oral cavity. And that people who have that are more prone to having dis, uh, uh, eruptive um, plaque and, and acute MI. So again, there are genetic factors that, that affect inflammation uh, uh, as well. So. It's, it's a mix of things causing damage, but also um, uh, uh, underlying factors that the, themselves, internal things that, that lead to damage. And then, but using nutrients as a, um, um, let's say, a less focused and, and broader spectrum um, um, uh, effector of, of inflammation uh, has, I'm just gonna say it has great promise because I don't think we've proven yet uh, that uh, you know, we're going to affect hard endpoints. So I'm going to need uh, 10,000 people followed, but you know, within our registry for five to 10 years before we will even have a, a reasonable chance of saying that we're not just changing biomarkers; we're actually changing outcomes in a in a positive way. And, and do you have to have a specific condition to be in that registry? So right now, uh, Verta focuses on people with type 2 diabetes, but anybody. Um, who is willing to pay out of pocket can, can uh, uh, sign up to be a Verta patient, um, uh, barring certain exclusions. But uh, you know, we don't, most of, of the patients that we're managing right now, the cost of our treatment is paid for by their employer because we can save the employer more money in a year and a half than the program costs. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's, uh, it's a, a win for the employer and definitely a win for the employee. Thank you very much. Well, staying in the semantic field of well-formulated, <laughs> um, would you would you say that a well-formulated ketogenic can you diet a would be? So I can hear, please. Yeah? Okay. So, <clears throat> would there be any difference in a well-formulated ketogenic diet for you know younger children or growing adolescents and adults in terms of you know grams of protein per kilogram of reference weight etc so would there be a, a different recommendation or would that be you know like the 1.5 type of recommendation across the board i try to base my recommendations on data and i have not studied that um, there was a, a modest amount of study of, of um, pediatric and adolescent patients um, in the same unit that i was when i was doing my phd at mit and uh, there's a thesis done by a guy who probably doesn't admit he did that now named uh, uh, Dr. William Dietz. And he studied uh, adolescents with severe obesity, some of them with Prader-Willi syndrome. And his conclusion was two grams per kilo of protein reference body weight 
was what was needed to um, um, maintain uh, the ability to not just maintain lean tissue, but to actually gain lean tissue. Uh, but I think that was in like eight or 10 people. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of room here for further research. Excellent question. Ask me in 10 years. I'm, I'm never sorry. Well, this is for my sister who couldn't come today. Um, and she, I should say, is a very tiny lady. She looks bird-like, so she's a very tiny lady. And she's doing keto, however, um, successfully. She has had a history of osteoporotic bones, and she's been on Fosamax in the past and Forteo in the past, has not been doing it lately. But a uh, new DEXA scan, again, was bad. So her doctor, of course, is pushing for those. So she said, could you please ask, um, what I should do other than weight training to help my bones uh, to deal with this osteoporosis while on keto. And then I don't know who, if it was Dr. Google or who else told her um, to try DHEA and are there any contraindications to her doing, taking supplemental DHEA while on keto? Well, in regards to the, um, the osteoporosis, I mean, you know, vitamin K2, vitamin D work very well together. She does do those, yeah. Good, because K2 really isn't talked about nearly enough. Um, I don't know anything about the DHEA contraindication, so my initial response would be to say no, but I clearly don't know all the literature as you have <laughs> admitted to as well, so I don't know about that. No, okay. Is she getting enough protein? She is, I mean, we've been working on that a lot, like making sure she gets protein, and she's one of those people asked to eat she definitely has to get her in her three meals a day because she tends to lose weight. Um, so to stabilize her weight and those kinds of things, she has upped her protein. Okay. And also d definitely does a lot of fat. Okay. And weight-bearing exercise, of course, sort of the, the basics. Yeah, I, I laugh. Like, her, for her, walking is not weight-bearing because she weighs almost nothing, you know. For me, it's like a little activity every day. Um, but, yeah, so I've also talked to her about strength training and increasing her strength training. Um, so, but thank you. First, I apologize if I say your last name incorrectly. Ruscio, Dr. Ruscio. Close enough. It's it's Ruscio, but okay. Um, uh, you mentioned Helminth theory uh, therapies, and this is something I've read about, research, looked at clinical studies that were currently being done in places, and I, I was became familiar with it with um, David Pritchard at the University of Nottingham, who was doing it with um, Nicator Americanus. And from everything I saw in, the Amer in America that where they were looking at that for autoimmune, specifically even Crohn's, uh, they were seeing that they were using the pig roundworm instead of the human roundworm, and so its lifespan was only like two weeks instead of potentially permanently. Uh, and I was just wondering, do you know, is there anyone in the U.S. who is willing to do that to augment? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if the research shows it's going to be a cure for Crohn's, but it could augment other therapies that they are trying in order to? Well, William Parker, who's at Duke, has really been keeping an eye on this. He's been on the podcast. We, we've, um, we've had three Helminth experts on the podcast to get different perspectives. In terms of in the US, I mean, it's tough because no one really wants to touch this because to get clearance to do these studies is, is near impossible. Well, um, just so you know, if, if you're friends with any of them and they need a non-disease person who's willing to take a few worms, well, they so can there, there, call me up. So there's part of the challenge, right? I mean, you know, as a doctor, you're held more liable for making a recommendation than if you weren't, right? So um, they can't even really sanction these things outside of, inside of a research study that oftentimes has very specific selection criteria and parameters. Um, looking at some of the data, and I don't profess to be a helmet expert, although Mark Davis, also on the podcast, uh, is very knowledgeable on uh, helminths. It does seem to be mixed with inflammatory bowel disease. I would say a fecal microbiota transplant has much better data to support it, and I think the FDA will next approve FMT for inflammatory bowel disease, because the, the data are pretty compelling. So if you were going to do one or the other, I would do the FMT. Why? Part of the reason is there are many different worms, and we really are just scratching the surface of what worm works for what person, for what condition, and in what context. And there's a lot there to determine. And while the worms may restore this missing aspect of the biome, right, that we evolve, most hunter-gatherers tend to be majority parasitized, 
uh, and that may actually be symbiotic, this, this immune pushback on our immune systems preventing them from becoming overzealous, there's still a lot there that we have to learn. Whereas in FMT, we have much more data. In fact, I think we've even got to the point now where there's been meta-analyses showing, I believe the average response rate was about 45 to 50% with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so if you were to do one or the other, I'd say FMT. Uh, could you do them both? That's what I was um, hoping to find out. Yes. Can we do both? <laughs> um, I would think you could. I mean, we don't really know. Uh, Garen Aglietti owns a clinic in Mexico where he's not regulated, and he's also been on the podcast, and he's very passionate about this bioindividuality with different helmets. So it's, uh, it's dicey. Now, some of the people are also, as uh, Nancy O'Hara is, using non-human uh, helmets because they only have a short lifespan. And, and so the, the pro there is you can get around, you can actually ship them and send them to people and there's not this heavy regulation. Mm -hmm. The con is you have to re-inoculate every few weeks. Yes. Um, so there's a lot there to learn. Um, I would just be cautious and do your research with what you're gonna do and I would look into some of those experts that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to try to get some guidance rather than doing this on your own, uh, definitely. Okay, thank you. For the whole panel, uh, I'd like to hear, hear thoughts about using keto diet in different states of renal failure if there is not enough evidence, um, which is the more important aspect someone uh, that is with renal failure must be, be aware of. And you said, you said renal? Renal failure, kidney disease. Yeah, so the, the first concept is, is the concept that the ketogenic diet or any high-protein diet is, is hard on the kidneys and shouldn't be used because it can hurt the kidneys. And that, with normal kidney function, that's just blatantly false. So then the question becomes, well, what stage of kidney disease does it become a problem? Um, I think clearly if you're on the verge of dialysis, you know, stage four, stage five kidney disease, very advanced kidney disease, that's where you have to be more cautious of it. In the middle, I'm not aware of any, you know, clear threshold of where it, it becomes a concern. Um, so I, I wouldn't know exactly what to say other than it, it's clearly a spectrum. And the further you are to the normal spectrum, the less you have to worry about it. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any experience in that. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, returning to the subject of the magnesium supplementation, have any of you tried or considered magnesium L3 and 8? It's marketed as magteen. I use magteen at times. I, I don't know if it does anything different. I haven't noticed any difference, but I figured, you know, it's, it's out there. I'll try it. Um, I, uh, yeah, that's all I can say about it. I, I don't think it's, uh, it's as potent for muscle cramps, when I've taken it in the evening, I, I might still get a muscle cramp. Um, so it's not my preferred for that reason. But I don't really know the biochemistry of the different types. I do want to say, though, um, it, about magnesium supplementation, magnesium glycinate usually does not cause that kind of, um, that drawing in of the water into the, um, into the colon. So most of the people that are taking magnesium glycinate aren't getting the GI issue from it. But I do like them to take it. I don't like people to take these kinds of things right before bed, which is what a lot of people do. I'll just comment that um, the increased motility is not often, oftentimes isn't associated with any symptoms. It's just that the dwell time in the, the small bowel is, is foreshortened and therefore the absorption is impaired. But it doesn't, it doesn't have an overt laxative effect that people notice doesn't even cause barbarigmy, uh, but it, but it, I, I just find that it, the, um, uh, basically free magnesium in whatever form, uncountered by calcium, uh, is much less effective than using a balance of calcium and magnesium. Um, so we, in the old days, used to have people take Tums and Maalox tablets together <laughs> to get common, you know, that, that, that combination, but the slow release version is, you know, in my clinical experience over, the 20 years or so it's been available has, has been very positive. Well, um, is there and maybe for the next meeting, I'll bring uh, 100 bottles. By the way, you can, 
It's not available in Canada for our Canadian colleagues here and to, for whatever reason, but so I actually take it to Canada when I go to Canada to sell it on the street. I, I give it to my, my colleague, Dr. Jay Wortman, uh, but I'll bring 100 bottles to the next meeting if I'm invited back next year and, and uh, half of them will be placebo and half of them will be real <laughs> and we will do a, a randomized controlled trial. Anyway. Yeah, I like that. Uh, the formulation is marketed to, or it was developed to pass the blood-brain barrier, and I'm wondering if there's any negative consideration to that. It was developed out of MIT. And you probably are referring to the work of Dr. David Perlmutter. He, uh, he's a big fan of Magtine, and he says it does have a calming effect on the brain because it's the only form that can cross the blood-brain barrier. But I think that a lot of us have a really disrupted blood-brain barrier. Um, so I, you said today um, that if you have a leaky gut, you, or somebody said you have a leaky gut, you have a leaky brain. So there is going to be a lot of things that pass the blood-brain barrier, and magnesium might be one of them. Okay, thank you. Hi. First of all, thank you for all of your great, great presentations. They were of great value for me. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, and in my practice, I'd like to know your thoughts uh, from a clinical uh, perspective. Um, if you have any general recommendations or, or, or practical tips uh, at the time of uh, lab taking, of how many hours of fasting, if you re would recommend that uh, they have a meal or they, they um, skip a meal, um, how many hours, uh, or other general recommendations. Uh, because we've seen uh, all along the weekend that uh, because of the dumb phenomenon, uh, of all of the Dave Feldman's work, that you can indeed modify your results uh, with what you do in the days prior to the lab. So uh, I was wondering if, uh, what are your thoughts in regards to this? Well, this is not related to blood sugar. I'm not sure if you're wondering about a, a yeah, whole... Lab take, uh, yeah, okay. blood sugar. Um, yeah, well, I'll just, sugar and I'll other, just mention other this markers as well. briefly anyway. Um, biotin, supplemental biotin may interfere with thyroid readings, TSH and T4. So. Um, you may want to make sure people discontinue biotin for at least a few days before running your TSH and T4. It may skew that. Okay. So you've got the man standing behind you there, it looks like. But um, you know, one thing that, that he's shown, that Dave Feldman has shown, is how, how much you can change your lipid numbers. And since his work has become more prominent, I've had so many patients come up to me and say, I want to do the Feldman protocol to lower my LDL. And my response to that is, look, I love Dave Feldman. I will praise him to the end of the world. But if you're my patient, I don't want you to do the Feldman protocol. I want to see what your lipids really are. So I want you to eat consistently for weeks before you get your blood test. I don't want you to change a thing. I want to see what you're at at your baseline and your normal. And then if you want to like fool your insurers or fool your other doctors or whatever, go for it and change it as much as you want. But I think consistency is the most important thing. And then yes, for lipids, I prefer fasting because um, triglycerides are very sensitive uh, to eating, and then if you want to be as consistent as possible, if you want to compare test to test, the easiest way to compare is fasting, because otherwise it's, well, how soon did you eat before the test, what did you eat before the test, and your triglycerides are going to vary accordingly. So um, for me, when it comes to lipids, I want, you know, 8 to 12 hours of fasting, but before that I want a consistent diet of your baseline. Any specific time of day? Time of day? Yes. Uh, again, for lipids, I think I think morning is good, uh, is probably best um, for you know glucose. Again, not first thing when you wake up. If it can be an hour or two after you wake up for the for the dawn phenomenon, and then also I should mention postprandial tests are so important because um, we talk so much about fasting glucose when really the better measure is is a postprandial glucose, because um, that's going to be in with insulin potentially too, a lot of the craft tests, which we also don't do enough of because it's, you know, logistically more difficult and the patients don't always want to do it and comply. Um, but that's another uh, big consideration to measure postprandial tests. So, you know, there's nothing that says every test has to be fasting. You can say, okay, let's check your lipids today with the fasting glucose. Next week, I want you to get a blood test two hours after you eat your standard lunch, and let's see what your glucose does. You can you know, mix it up depending on what you're looking at, too. Yeah, from a clinical perspective for me, um, 
It, number one, it depends what I'm treating. If I'm treating obesity, uh, diabetes, what it is. But I like to get a baseline measurement with a, an eight-hour fast the day after I first see my patients. That's my baseline. And I understand that there are going to be numbers that are off, but I want to know what that baseline is so that I can use my patients as an internal control. Part of it is that I know what's going on. Part of it is I use this as a positive reinforcement to my patients when they see their numbers change in a positive way. So I, I do the um, blood work sequentially, and it also depends. A1C, I'll measure every three months. Um, I then try do not do blood work for at least six to eight weeks bef uh, after that baseline because a lot of the parameters are going to change as they keto adapt. Remember, it's not just going from burning sugar to burning fat. It's also ramping up and ramping down enzyme systems so that you become more efficient at burning fat. And I want to see the triglycerides going down. And for my diabetics, I particularly want to know what their, uh, if we can manage insulin sensitivity or get a return of a degree of insulin sensitivity, whether they go from a stage two to a stage one insulin resistance or type two diabetes down, um, it takes time for that sensitivity to return. Uh, in terms of fasting, I then use a protocol where I try to get the patients to eat only once or twice a day. And I try to do my blood work just before that first meal of the day. And that should be some time, I try to get them not to eat before noon. But getting blood work done in the first thing in the morning is going to give you, particularly in the diabetics, abnormal readings. So that's our protocol, and it's got to fit into the patient's life. And the purpose is not only to look to detect places where you're looking for issues that you want to address, but also as a motivator for our patients to continue doing what they're doing. Great. Thank you all. If I could actually just add real quick to what you said, Brett. Uh, the, the protocol is very exciting. It's lots of fun, yes. But absolutely, uh, my ideal, if you guys want to do it, is do it just after you've gotten a baseline test. Don't, don't wait like six months, hear about the protocol, or for that matter, a year, and then do the protocol for the first time without it being anywhere near a baseline test. I feel like that, unfortunately, kind of robs you and your doctor of a better perspective. Uh, likewise, and I probably should say this more publicly more often, a lot of times people want to use the protocol as a way to kind of fool their doctor. I am, and let me be very vocal about this, I believe no matter who your doctor is, you should continue to be honest with them and give them the information even if they don't share your goals. But if they don't share your goals, you may want to consider then looking for another doctor. But that's, that's up to you to do. I don't think that there's any really positive outcomes with deceiving them in that sense. So I just, I really wanted to be sure that I got that part forward real quick. So my, my question actually is about electrolytes. <laughs> uh, I myself actually supplement electrolytes. It took me a while to figure it out that I actually need roughly around 10 grams of salt. I actually have to credit Finney to some degree and uh, uh, salt fix. I always mess up his name, so I'm not going to try to say it. Yes, what he said. Uh, to get to a level in which I was comfortable enough to do it, but on top of that, when I travel, I find I don't end up adding enough salt to my food, so I usually actually supplement additionally with uh, sports salts and so forth. I'm curious if anybody who's a, who's a panelist here actually uh, proactively seeks out more electrolytes than usual themselves. I'm not quite sure it's kind of generic terms, but more electrolytes... So, for, for that matter, do you proactively seek out, let, let's just say salt in particular, do you actually seek out having more salt than you did when you started the diet? I don't have to seek it out, it's in my freezer. <laughs> I, I, I make chicken broth and oxtail soup, uh, typically one or the other every two weeks. Typically I'll make 12 to 16 cups of it, and I just have this, I have this big pot, and it's on the stove for most of one day and a weekend, and uh, when it cools down, I put it into unit one cup doses and stick them in the freezer. Um, and I, uh, I measure the salt, so it's, it's about one gram of sodium per, per one cup serving. Uh, and it's just very easy when it's there just to use it. Um, so do you know about what your average is for five salt? Gram, five grams per day, Okay. total sodium. I, when I eat salt my food to taste, it's about three grams per day. And I add two in, in supplementation. When I travel, I carry bouillon cubes. I have a little immersion heater with me. And, and oftentimes, I'll have that in the morning before I have my first cup of coffee. Um, uh, I typically um, you know, will, will take it opportunistically, but almost always within half an hour to an hour before planned endurance exercise. Um, 
and then just before exercise, I'll take about 12 ounces of free water, uh, and that gives my body enough that, because when you start ex endurance exercise and you, quote, warm up, you expand your circulating volume by about half a liter to a liter, and it has to be sodium rich. If you don't, you're gonna be thirsty right away once you start exercising. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Kenny. I'm from, I'm a physician from Indonesia. So uh, we're not a rich country, and most of us couldn't even afford olive oil or butter. I hadn't seen olive oil since I was high school. So, and you can find vegetable oils and margarine in every single household in our country. So this is a global problem. I'm not, I know I'm not speaking only for my country, but I know there are a lot of population and developing countries that has the same problem about income. And my question is, what's your take on high vegetable oil keto diet and in the clinical settings? Well, uh, olive oil is a fruit oil, and coconut oil is a fruit oil. Uh, and you, I presume you have access to coconut oil, but it's high saturated fat, but a fair amount of medium chain fat, so it uh, tends to be preferentially and rapidly oxidized. Um, but a traditional Asian uh, uh, fat source is lard. Uh, and lard typically is about 50% monounsaturate. So uh, if one is seeking a, a monounsaturate source that is reasonably economical, lard would, would be an alternative to olive oil. Yeah, there is a big problem with that because Indonesia is the largest Muslim population in the world, so we don't need lard at all. Okay. Yeah. Point well taken. <laughs> yeah. So as an expat there, I would seek it out. <laughs> so um, uh, is it more important to prioritize the quality of oil or uh, lower in carbs? in the clinical settings. Quality of oil or? Uh, would, would you pr prioritize uh, high quality of oils or uh, the amount of carbs in clinical settings? Um, Just if I can jump, oh sorry. I, there's no question in my mind that I would prioritize carbohydrates because they are the things that cause the toxic effect. It's the lack of fat that to a certain extent has uh, some uh, better, the, some, some devaluing uh, aspects. But the overwhelming issue, whichever nation you look at, is the abundance and the frequency with which people consume carbohydrates. And I think restricting or cutting back on the carbohydrates is a priority in terms of disease cause. Um, lack of fat can have some vitamin deficiencies. There's certainly with children under the age of four or five, there's brain development issues, uh, that type of thing. But this whether you're having the saturated fat or the unsaturated or the, or the uh, polyunsaturated fat economically is less important than cutting back, in my perspective, on the carbohydrates. I would say there's a dual priority there that you certainly want to eliminate any kind of hydrogenated fats, any trans fats, but I think most people here already know that, so. Um, but yeah, I mean the carbohydrates, but definitely the trans fats as well, and there's, there's been a reduction in this country, but I don't know what's going on in other countries. Okay. Thank you. So I'm just a poor country pathologist from Denver. And w one of my issues has been the, the throwing around of the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and talking about how you have to fix that ratio, but that, I don't understand why that would make sense. Because to me, an omega-3 fat is a structural fat for the brain. It's not really a fuel source. The omega-6 fats, yes, some of them get turned into prostaglandins and that sort of thing. But is, there, is this ratio rational? It makes no sense to me. And could, to me, it's, the, it's kind of, the amount of the fat rather than the ratio of the fats that to me intuitively makes more sense. So can you help me with that? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Are we talking about absolute levels of omega-6, omega-3 versus a ratio um, and which is more important? 
I think a ratio is, is clean and easy to look at, and there's been a fair amount of data about the ratios published in either animal populations or hunter-gatherer societies, so that's made it very popular and something you can, you can change and, and see change right before your eyes. So I guess you know, the diplomatic answer is yes, both are important. Um, if you have a good ratio, but your omega-6s are still very high and only balanced out by a very high omega-3s, that's not necessarily the best approach. And that's part of the problems. We've, we've seen a lot of studies, or a lot of publicity of studies recently showing that omega-3 supplements don't have long-term benefits. And I think a big caveat there is if that's in a high omega-6 diet, you're not doing yourself any favor. So the ratio may look good because you're ingesting all these omega-3s, but your absolute omega-6 level is still so high that you're, counter, you're counteracting the beneficial effects of the omega-3s. Now flip that around, there was another study being pushed around or was shown around that showed measuring omega-3 levels rather than just ingestion of the supplements. And that one did show a benefit for those who had higher omega-3 levels, showing that once you, it, it, the better measurement is what you have inside your body rather than just the supplement because it can be counteracted by the omega-6. So, I mean, that's a good point that you bring up, and I, I guess the answer is both. You want to know the ratios and the absolute amount because too high of omega-6 is going is to counteract the beneficial effects of the omega-3s. Uh, oh, so I think it's an ex excellent answer. And the other thing is that my understanding is that the reason why the ratio does matter in addition to the absolute amounts is because in, you, know, you were saying that DHA is a structural fatty acid for the brain and that um, the omega-6s are, you know, part of the pr promotion of inflammation pathway. But there's another omega-3, which is EPA, which, uh, so EPA is the omega-3 that promotes healing and that needs to be roughly in balance with omega-6, uh, which promotes inflammation. And those two uh, omega-3 fatty acids, um, uh, so, so the omega-3 EPA and the omega-6 uh, need to be roughly in balance because they compete for the same enzyme in the pathways that lead towards the inflammatory and, and, and anti-inflammatory molecules, if that makes sense. So if one is far higher than the other, it will, it will tend to reduce the amount, uh, the, the flow of the, other, of the other fatty acid through those pathways, if that makes sense. That's, that was a great deep dive. Um, there is a test. I, I know other, there's a lot of places that would offer this, but um, a doctor recommended this uh, out of Mayo. Um, uh, that tests the fatty acid profile, and that's what they're looking at is omega-6 and omega-3. So you'd also get, I think, some sort of interpretation from that, too. This actually is a very complex area, uh, and some people kind of become too focused on one fat or the other. Uh, as Jeff Volick pointed out yesterday, there is actually a very close, surprisingly co close correlation between the amount of arachidonic acid in skeletal muscle and insulin sensitivity of that tissue. That is, the higher your arachidonic acid, the more insulin sensitive you are. I think that brings out the point that arachidonic acid is only pro-inflammatory if it is, has oxygen added to it, either by cyclooxygenase enzyme or reactive oxygen species. Uh, and so, um, trying to bring down the omega-6 level by reducing omega-6 intake, uh, A, there's so much out there that we already have more than plenty, uh, and, and B, it, the, the, the culprit there is, is the oxygen being added, so either injury or oxidative stress driving that, that ill effect rather than the amount of arachidonic acid per se, um, which just makes it even more complex, and I apologize for, you know, uh, making something simple look more, more difficult than who knows, maybe it is. Hello, I have a relative who tried ketogenic that was not very successful, who is overweight. And one of you, and I don't remember which one, just mentioned in this, that um, having the gallbladder, uh, gallbladder removed might have an impact on the way that they adapt. And um, this, my family relative who was unsuccessful, also had their gallbladder removed. And I was just wondering, is there a different kind of well-formulated ketogenic protocol you should be following if you have had that surgery? Uh, 
Uh, first of all, I don't think having a gallbladder removed has anything, I can't think of anything that connects it to success or failure. Um, I think there is a modification in how you ramp up your fat consumption. Uh, really the way it works is when you eat a high fat meal, the gallbladder squeezes and it's that bile that mixes in with the fat that absorbs the, uh, um, the fat in the terminal ileum, puts it into your lymphatics and dumps it into your blood up in your neck. So the ramp up is a little bit uh, different for those patients. But ultimately, success or failure really comes down to how effectively they're following the ketogenic diet. Um, and I really start, my focus, because of the lipophobia, I, my focus is primarily on reducing carbohydrate consumption. And, and that's the elephant in the room, is it, because it's everywhere. And then slowly we can introduce fats. And whether you introduce the fats in egg and avocado and bacon and that kind of thing, slowly, so that you give them real food to eat. It, it really comes down to the psychology of the change rather than the biomechanics of the change. As physicians, we want to understand what's going on in them biochemically. But really, from a patient's perspective, they want to look at this culturally and from a capability perspective. And that's my wheelhouse. That's where I have to, I can have the best advice. If they can't follow it or they're not willing or able to do it, it's of no value whatsoever. So it's a slow ramp up. Remember, they've been eating one way for their whole lives. So to change it in a day or change it in a month, it's about the same, as long as there's progression. I, I, I would like uh, to ask you a question about that, um, because I do see it as a, uh, a, a sort of a fear of fat. Uh, they've, they've had their gallbladder removed, they're scared to death they're not going to be able to do this, and yes, they can do this. But um, what I suggest, and tell me if I'm wrong in doing this, is uh, uh, the pancreat, the high lipase pancreatic enzyme that Johns Hopkins Hospital recommends for um, fat digestion for kids on these really super high fat diets. Um, and then, they've, then I'll say, okay, well now maybe you don't wanna you know, try it for, and, and then people find out they can do it, they've forgotten to take it or whatever, they're still digesting the fat. Um, but it's not just a placebo effect, because I did my N of 1 on it, and it really does make a difference in terms of fat digestion. Is there any downside for somebody with gallbladder removal? There really isn't. Uh, we've used some of the cystic fibrosis protocols on some of our kids. Uh, again, it's a question of taking it. The other thing to remember about the gallbladder is if you've had your gallbladder taken out, that thing didn't just become bad in a day. That gallbladder has been dysfunctional for a long, long time, and you can test that with HIDA scans. So if your gallbladder hasn't been functioning properly anyway in terms of st bile storage or the squeeze, then taking it out really makes a less dramatic effect. The place we see the biggest effect, in the old days when we did gastric bypass, and thank God I was never part of that crime, um, there's, they used to automatically take people's gallbladders out whether they were sick or not. And those patients really suffered because um, they couldn't uh, eat the, the amount of fat that they wanted to. So we had some experience about slowly introducing the fat in them. But I think that the enzymatic pathway is of value, but again, it's a transition. transition and I wouldn't keep exactly. them on it forever. Yeah. yeah. And was there a reaction she was having that was making her unsuccessful with the diet? I didn't, I didn't catch that part, you know, what, what the problem was. She definitely uh, had a lot of diarrhea. Okay, diarrhea, that was, was going to ask about. So there's a small percentage of people after cholecystectomy who will develop what's known as bile acid malabsorption or bile acid diarrhea. And sometimes people will be taking supplemental bile because they've read that they need it, but in these people it actually makes them worse and it can provocate their diarrhea. So for some people, and I've seen cases like this where they came in thinking, oh, it must be hydrogen sulfide SIBO because my normal SIBO test was negative and it must be something, and we took them off their bile supplement, diarrhea went away. So if, they're, if she's on bile, consider having her do an experiment off the bile. Um, there also may be something thwarting terminal ileal reabsorption of the bile, because bile goes all the way down the small intestine at the terminal ileum, it should be reabsorbed. If it's not reabsorbed and it gets into the colon, too much of it anyway, it can be a laxative. So there are natural compounds, actually they, they also can bind to cholesterol or lower cholesterol that, that bind to bile, and there's also pharmaceuticals that can bind to bile. I don't think those are great options, but they have shown benefit for people with bile acid malabsorption using some of these bile sequestrants. Cholestyramine, Wellcol, um, Gugulu are, are a, a few of these different compounds that are bile sequestrants. The other thing to consider is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth interferes with the ability of conjugation, deconjugation of bile, and this is a little bit more speculative, but part of the reason why SIBO may cause diarrhea 
potentially maybe through causing some inflammation in the GI and therefore thwarting malabsorption or changing the, the conjugation to conjugation status. So there may be some underlying SIBO that's provocating that also. Wonderful. Um, I was hoping you guys could speak to the safety of using a keto ketogenic diet with our alcoholic patients who have struggled with acute, not chronic, acute pancreatitis once, if not multiple times? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I have no experience with that. <laughs> yeah, in terms of pancreatitis, the, the key thing is to avoid increased, with acute pancreatitis too, is to avoid increased inflammation. And particularly your lipid enzymes are the ones that you want to go through. And that is one of the places where even in the acute stage, you can fortify their diet with uh, um, some of the lipid produce, at least the um, uh, lipid absorbing enzymes. And I use a cystic fibrosis protocol in those patients for a period of time. The other key thing is you've got to look at what the trigger of that pancreatitis is. And if you can identify that and remove the cause, it's unlikely they're going to get back. If they've got stones, that's a whole different ballgame, and that's the acute on chronic pancreatitis. Or the alcoholics, that's a different story. But I've certainly had no experience of putting somebody on a ketogenic diet because of pancreatitis, but I can see no reason why there would be increased harm. Yeah, I worked in gastroenterology for about five years, and it seems like there's this dual theory of direct toxin to the pancreas from the alcohol itself and the hypertriglyceridemia that the carbohydrate can perpetuate. So it seems like if we could time it just right, it might fix the brain chemistry that drives the addiction. Would you agree with that? I think, I think that's a reasonable thought, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure who this question is for, we'll just see who answers it. Um, between the age of 45 and 50, I was hypertensive. I took the medications. I got up two to four times per night to use the little boy's room. Um, then I went keto, or low carb, high fat. And within six months, I was off, or at half medication. And within a year, I was no longer hypertensive and completely off medication. But it still took me about a year before the cycle of getting up in the middle of the night kind of faded away. And uh, for the last two years, I get up zero or one time per night. It's really great. <laughs> Recently, they changed the guidelines. Uh, the last time I had my, high bar my blood pressure taken, it was where it normally is in the, um, the last 99 readings average to uh, 135 over 85, so it's on the higher side of the old scale. But that's now considered hypertensive again. Sleep or medications? <laughs> Do I have less to worry about with high blood pressure at that rate? Um, eating an anti-inflammatory diet, um, it's, I guess it's kind of like that LDL question. If you have a high LDL but you've got great other numbers because we eat this way, the LDL is less of a concern, or at least we see it that way. Um, is higher blood pressure a less, less concerning for a uh, ketogenic eater, lifestyler like me? Yeah, so great question. You know, anytime we talk about what the studies show with lipids or with blood pressure and what that means for people on a ketogenic diet, the answer, of course, is we don't know because uh, studies don't control for that. They don't look for that subset, and there are going to be very few patients. So. Everybody in this room is sort of outside the guidelines, if you want to think about it. If you say, do the gui were the guidelines done on people like me with my physiology? And the answer, for the most part, is, is no. But there's still the, sort of, you know, the information we have, the studies we have, are, are what we have to base our, our decisions off of. So there was this trial, the SPRINT trial, and that was one of the, the main influencers on lowering the blood pressure um, guidelines to now say, that what was once pre-hypertension or high normal is now hypertension. And, and in that trial, I mean, to be fair, there, there was a difference um, in, in terms of a, com a combined cardiovascular outcome. So not, not all cause mortality for one. Um, and there was also an increase in side effects from the medications used to treat the blood pressure. So it, it comes down to the, the usual risk versus benefit decision of which is more appropriate for you as an individual. 
because a lot of the people, well, not a lot, but a, a higher percentage of the people were having problems with their kidneys when they were more aggressively treated. A higher percentage of people were having lightheadedness and falls when they were more aggressively treated. So if you're someone who's already prone to that, I would say absolutely not. I'd rather have you with the higher blood pressure than with the, you know, with the more aggressive medication to exacerbate those side effects. So it's, it's a long-winded way of saying the difference in that trial was small. It's not like it was dramatic night and day, 50% reduction or anything like that. So it was a small difference. It was a difference, but you have to figure out what's right for you as an individual with your individual risk-benefit analysis. Something from a lifestyle perspective to consider is obtaining chronic, frequent sun exposure. Uh, there, there's a fair amount of data showing that sun exposure, so there's a fair amount of data showing, that there's some evidence showing that sun exposure through facilitation of nitric oxide may help with vasodilation and therefore lower blood pressure. There's a wealth of data showing that regular sun exposure seems to have a cardioprotective effect amongst other benefits. So um, exactly how much to get, you have to personalize that based upon your skin tone, but two to three days per week, getting 10 to 15 minutes in direct sunlight in the middle of the day unprotected seems to be a reasonable recommendation. If that might burn your skin, then shoot for south of that. Don't ever you know, burn, of course, but that's something from a lifestyle perspective that may be able to shave a few points off of your blood pressure and may have a good impact on your overall uh, outcome. Just a, just a couple of comments on, uh, in that regard. One of the things that we tend to ignore, and I'm not a cardiologist, is heart rate. And what I find ubiquitously in my patients is their heart rate comes down significantly. And we tend to be overly focused on blood pressure, but if your heart's beating less often, that has a protective effect as well. And um, the other part also, and I, this may be blasphemy in this audience, but I tell my patients to drink significant, significantly less water. Drink when you're thirsty. Don't aim for 64 ounces or eight glasses of water a day. And I think that when you're ketogenic and when you're consuming a lot of salt, your body conserves fluid a lot better, and you don't need to top it off all the time. When you've got these huge fluid fluctuations on a carbohydrate-based diet, uh, that's a concern. And sometimes we're too obsessed with the old algorithm of drinking eight cups of water. If, if we had to drink 64 ounces of, of water a day, we would never have evolved because in the plains of Africa, that amount of water doesn't exist. So, uh, you know, that's kind of my mentality. And if you look at the first world people, they drink far less than we tell, up, uh, uh, tell ourselves to drink. And I think that's a carbohydrate-based recommendation, not a keto-based recommendation. Okay, so we've been here for two hours already, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, it's a lot of hard work for these guys to sit up here for all the time. Are you okay with finishing whoever's in, in the line here? If you're not, then you're welcome to leave. Um, but yeah, what I'd like to propose is like nobody else join the queue and we, we work through the rest of these and then bring this thing to a close. It's been awesome. Thanks. I'm a nurse practitioner in women's health and I an OBGYN and I've had uh, patients that were pregnant and postpartum asking is it okay to do a ketogenic diet and I'm very hesitant to answer. I know that a lot of this were in uh, uncharted ground um, and so my answer has always been you know lowering your carbs is always a good thing but to actually go keto is there any information that you have on that or resources that I can look into? I know there is a book out there, um, and it's sort of vague. I'm sorry? There you go. Thank you. Lily Nichols. Real Food for Pregnancy. Real, there you go. Real Food for Pregnancy. Okay. That's all I know about it. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that it's necessary to be on a ketogenic diet during pregnancy. The single most important developmental aspect of a baby is their brain and we're not getting enough fat, especially the saturated fats and cholesterol in the SAD diet. That's the first part. The second thing is that the human birth canal is not as big as most babies' heads. So a large part of brain development in humans occurs post-birth, postpartum. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, while the head is an important part to come out, we see so many huge bodies on babies 
that now it becomes the girth of the baby that's often a predeterminant of whether they can give birth naturally, and that is the diabetogenic effect of excess carbohydrates, because babies' weights um, actually affect their neurologic development. And diabetic babies are floppy babies, they're poorly developed neurologically, and I'm going to put this out there, I have no evidence to support this, but I do believe that the increase in neurologic deficits, particularly the spectrum disorders, are from a paucity of fat in the diet, especially in the, in the antepartum and the early postpartum period, when you wean your baby onto formulas. Look at the breast milk nonsense that has just gone on uh, with the U.S. and the world. That, that just irked me. But also, when we wean our babies off breast milk, we wean them onto Cheerios and mac and cheese and fruit. And the, the, the fat deficit is enormous. So that's the one place where I think the sugar has a component, but the more important part is the fat. So to my mind, um, and I'll be radical on this, you're not being a good mom unless you're ketogenic during pregnancy. Something else to keep in mind would be your iodine content. If you're using sea salt, you're not eating fortified bread, you're not having any dairy. These are some of the most common sources of iodine in, in most of the food supply. Um, you may run the risk of iodine insufficiency, not necessarily deficiency, but even insufficiency subclinical can be detrimental for the neurological development of children. And there was recently a two-year published cohort study showing subclinical iodine deficiency in paleo dieters, likely for those exact reasons. So a good multi or a good prenatal will probably cover your bases there, but um, you may want to just give that extra attention. You can test it. A spot urine is not a great test. A 24-hour urine is a better test, but what the consensus seems to be in the research is a couple different you know, independently performed 24-hour urinalyses for a 24-hour urine iodine to get an assessment on that. So you could do that or you could just shoot to make sure she's getting her IDA through a good diet diary. One of the big concerns that comes up with patients a lot is kidney stones, skull stones on a ketogenic diet, low carb. Clinically, have you noticed a big change in uric acid levels or, or gout attacks? I, I personally haven't. I think a lot of the time people on a high carb diet, Dr. Lustig talked about this, will have a higher uric acid level. But clinically, is there a difference between being in ketosis and just being in a, on a low carb diet? Uh, you're cor absolutely correct. There is an acute rise in uric acid when uh, humans go into uh, nutritional ketosis. Uh, it's not caused by increased uric acid production. It's caused by competitive inhibition of uric acid excretion via what, what is called the organic acid secretory pathway. That's the same pathway that uh, excretes vitamin C and uh, aspirin and penicillin. All organic acids tend to compete one with the other. Um, so. And Jeff Bullock and I have looked at this before, and we, we realize it needs a lot more careful um, analysis. So we have better data. But it looks like uh, once uric acid spikes, it starts coming down by the end of the first week. But it takes 12 weeks to even, even though constant ket ketonemia is maintained, it takes 12 to 16 weeks to come back to baseline. Um, which implies that the kidney is undergoing some corrective change in how it handles organic acids as part of the keto adaptation process. But in terms of stones, uric acid is not coming out into the, you know, downstream of the glomerulus. So it's not going to, you're not going to have more of it. It's, it's being backed up in, in, the, in the bloodstream uh, to a modest degree. Um, or or gall, acute, gall acute stones, gout attacks, things like that. Um, they can occur in people who are prone to gout, and that's a, a small percentage of the population. Okay. So if somebody knows they have a history of gout, I usually have them have their allopurinol on hand. Okay. And don't take it prospectively, you know, don't, you know, don't take probenicid, because most of them aren't gonna have a gout attack anyway. Just, you know, and if you get it within the first 12 hours, you preempt almost all the symptoms, and people don't have a major flare. In terms of gallstone, there was, gallstones, there was a major rash of gallstones and sludge occurring in people on very low calorie formula ketogenic diets. I won't name any of the particular formulations, but typically they had less than five or 10 grams of fat total. Unless you eat about 30 grams of fat per day, you don't get adequate cholecystokinin signaling to the gallbladder to contract, so the gallbladder suffers ongoing stasis. And, and 
uh, as you lose body fat, you're not only losing the triglyceride, you're, you have to mobilize the, the free cholesterol stored inside the lipid droplet. And that's about one and a half milligrams per gram. It sounds small, right? But if you're losing 200 grams of body fat per day, which is half a pound of body fat, that's 300 milligrams of cholesterol that you already own that has to transit through your gallbladder every day. You do that for 100 days, you've got a big honker of a stone. Uh, so eat fat, at least 30 grams a day. Uh, and and when, when we do that, we rarely see gallstones occur. Thank you. I think just one comment about the gallstones. The gallstones are much more prevalent in carbohydrate-dominant people. And if you look at the metabolic pathway of supersaturated, supersaturated bile, uh, the carbophilic diet is one that induces gallstones. So the two things that protect against gallstones is frequent emptying of the gallbladder, which you get from a high, a high fat load. So if you can do that at least twice a day and empty that gallbladder, that's protective because the, the bile then, that supersaturated cholesterol runs out, but your cholesterol levels drop when you're not eating sugar. And that is the uh, lipid generating properties of the liver when it's turning sugar into fat. The um, calcium oxalate in the kidney and the uric acid stones um, are predominantly in my practice, and I see patients with gallstones and kidney stones on a regular basis, is a protein fat ratio when they start. So I get them to lower their protein ratio at first for the first month or two and increase their fat. If you're burning fat as your primary fuel source you, and your protein is not going down a, uh, a fuel source pathway, and that's kind of how I explain it to my patients, they're not going to get uric acid stones. The, the ammonia and the nitrogen is an important aspect to that. Same thing with the calcium oxalate. So, they have the fear of getting stones because it's a miserable thing, but if they're high enough on their fat and low enough on their protein, they should be fine. I just wanted to know that I got, that I, what I heard, whenever I'm having a full blood workup and I have to fast before they do the blood tests, I always make sure I'm there right when the building opens so I can go have breakfast afterwards. And what I was wondering is, now that I know that you shouldn't do that first thing in the morning, what is the best time when you're going to have the full blood workup to, to, to schedule it and go in when you have to fast before? My personal preference is just most of my patients will eat lunch and just before lunch. Okay. So Thank somewhere you. around noontime is the best time if you haven't had, and you know, everyone says, oh, don't drink. I don't have a problem with a little bit of water but um, certainly no, no calories for that time. And remember, you've gone from the night before, so your fast is a little bit longer. One of the other comments is that if you're doing this on a repetitive basis, be consistent. Yeah. Whatever you use, because it's not isolated numbers, you're your own internal control. So it's really comparative analyses, and you want to do it consistently, preferably same lab as well. I can wait till noon. <laughs> Yeah, I was just wondering if there's uh, any science to support apple cider vinegar being able to have a meaningful effect on lowering blood, uh, blood glucose and whether there's any known anti-nutrient properties. It might be one for you, Georgia, about apple cider vinegar. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Can you... Uh, it's just regarding apple cider vinegar and whether oh, it can have... Oh, apple cider an, vinegar. Yeah, oh. and can it have an effect on lowering blood glucose? and are there any known anti-nutrient properties? That is, that's not something I've looked at. Is that something anybody else here knows anything about, vinegar? I've heard it anecdotally, and I've actually seen it in some papers, but nothing really rigorous. But um, you could try it and see what it does, because I think it's one of those things that's going to be highly variable. But one thing to watch out for is uh, that, that taking it from a spoon can um, etch your teeth. So be sure that you're uh, either putting it in water or you're rinsing your mouth really thoroughly after, after doing that. Mm -hmm. And if it's etching your teeth, I wonder what else it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask about was uh, candida overgrowth and whether a ketogenic diet or perhaps a carnivorous diet, what effect that can have in um, you know, reducing symptoms. And is there anything behind candida being able to use ketones as a fuel source? I haven't seen anything published that suggests that candida could thrive on ketones, although you know, it could be possible. These organisms are, are fairly tricky and, and fairly adaptive. Um, but I, I would say more patients seem to do better on a lower carb diet as a general rule who have digestive involvement than do better on a higher carb diet. But you also see some patients who 
do better who have proven candida, documented candida, who actually notice that they feel a little bit better on some starches and, and fruits, which would be anti candida, you know, against the, the candida party line. Um, so I think taking into account someone's response is very important because your microbiota is infinitely complex. Right? You have your gut, you have your immune system, you have these other players in there, you have how it, you know, you have numerous things that are involved in the response. So I don't think it's a good idea ever to make dietary or treatment decisions that are overly centric re with regard to one thing, just about SIBO, just about H. pylori, just about candida. Um, you know, certainly, you know, there, there's at least some evidence showing that sugars can feed candida, but to, to cite that mechanism is, is different than saying you could cause a clinically significant flare of the candida by eating carbs. Um, so I know that's not a super direct answer to your question, but I would just take the person's overall net effect from a, a dietary derivation as your barometer for the, the change. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking on a nutritionist uh, standpoint. So my question is the application of the keto diet. So if you have a client that is either on a SAD diet or even on a zone diet, do you take them into the uh, keto diet application right away and going from the, the percentages of like a zone or a SAD diet to keto, or do you progress them to that point? I mean, I'm sorry? I mean, I just, uh, <laughs> when I try to ease what in the, I've tried in a few times in the past with groups of people to ease them into the ketogenic diet, uh, but it doesn't foreshorten the adaptation period. Uh, and so we typically have people do it cold turkey and go from however many hundreds of grams of carbs they were eating per day, typically in, in our virtual program to 30 grams. Um, and uh, cover them uh, with adequate hydration and sodium from, from day one if they're not on antihypertensive medications. Uh, and almost all of the symptoms that are described as keto flu or Atkins flu can be uh, significantly attenuated or, or prevented with adequate fluid and electrolyte management from day one. Uh, may, may I ask, would you do that same thing with a low weight person? If somebody was low weight, would you just pop them right in or, or would, you do, would you ease them in somehow? Um, they're going to lose, if they have normal muscle mass, they're going to lose about a kilo of, of uh, water associated with glycogen. Uh, and that can't be prevented with, with fat. But training them to eat, to eat adequate fat, um, un unless they have uh, you know, marginal um, uh, organ function for fat tolerance, so as, as mentioned, uh, impaired, uh, uh, some impairment of pancreatic or biliary function, uh, I do it acutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, just a couple of comments about that because that is kind of our wheelhouse. Uh, number one, it kind of upsets me that even people in this room don't think of a ketogenic diet as the diet that human beings are supposed to be on. That's the null. Um, we're genetically and evolutionarily designed to be on a ketogenic diet. So I can't think of a reason why somebody shouldn't be on that diet. That's my starting point. Uh, there are nuances in terms of getting people off, and the primary aspect that we focus on is the personality type of the patient. There are some patients that can take structure and rules and apply them immediately, uh, and that's your typical authoritarian person. And as long as there are no barriers to a rapid transition, uh, and really is, is both uh, mentally and physiologically getting used to the adaptation or the change, uh, you can rush that pretty quickly. For the more permissive people, um, there's no value to you giving them guidelines that they're not able to implement when you're out there. These people are not rats in cages. They're going to do it at their pace, and you've got to get a feel for that. And the only way you're going to do that is by engaging the patient in, in terms of what they're able to do in a stepwise progression. Um, one other comment about changing patients' perspectives is when you're dealing with a carbohydrate-dominant person, they're petrified of what they're giving up, and their whole focus is, I'm not allowed to have this, not... And the focus for the patient should be uh, transformed into what they are able to eat rather than what they're not eating. They want an awareness of what they shouldn't eat, but they really want to focus on what they can eat. And if you give them a list of lettuce, um, onion, tomato, and a piece of uh, hamburger, they're not going to put that together. If you can say you can eat a hamburger without a bun, um, that's a hell of a lot more palatable for those patients. So 
what I find is I point them to websites or to Facebook sites. For example, I put a plug out for the, and I've got no affiliation with it, the Banting Seven Day Meal Plan from South Africa. It's got beautiful pictures and beautiful ideas of what you can eat. And if it doesn't absolutely conform to what I say, that's fine because it's the message that I'm trying to get out. But you really want to take them on a journey of positivity and sustainability. So I think we all, as clinicians, we sometimes forget that these are human beings, not rats in cages. And we really have to individualize the speed. Whether you're the tortoise or the rabbit, you've got to determine which one you are in the race. Got it, thank you. Hi. Um, I uh, started keto uh, a few years ago, originally started to troubleshoot my epilepsy, but also that didn't really work for my epilepsy, so I love the lifestyle, so I've kind of continued it. Um, what I've been doing the last year and a half after reading the Walls pro Protocol by Terry Walls, I just, I learned that she was able to control her seizures through by changing her microbiome and eating lots of, lots of veggies and organ meats and things. They don't exactly follow that, but I do eat a lot of low glycemic veggies and I'm still able to stay in ketosis. Heard a lot of chatter this weekend and met some people this weekend uh, you know, who are eating a carnivore diet and some people here that have actually controlled their seizures by changing to a carnivore diet. I'm considering it. Um, my only concern, my major concern is that my parents in the 70s did, ate Atkins and my dad had horrible kidney stones and gallstones. And I know you guys just talked about it, but I was wondering if you could just talk about any type of preventative measures, supplements or nutritionally, things that I could do. I mean, I'm going, thinking about going full carnivore. That's a big enough change, but I don't, I'm afraid of getting stones and being miserable on keto. So any, any type of feedback. The, the one comment in America that I'll tell you is that when patients go full carnivore, and we had a few people that do that, they, can't, they cut the fat out of the darn food. You know, you're just supposed to skin the animal and put it on your plate, but here they skin the animal, take the fat away, and give you the lean muscles of the animal. So what you want to do is find a source where you can add a substantial amount of fat to your food. And I think the early phases of the Atkins, we still had that lipophobic overhang, and we were eating far more protein, and it wasn't balanced out with the fat. And I think you can actually reduce the incidence of a variety of different stones by increasing your fat versus protein ratio. Uh, the other thing we've also got to remember is that uh, while the ketogenic diet is the null hypothesis, it's not a panacea for all diseases. Uh, your seizure disorder, just like some of the type 1 diabetics that we deal with, it's not just about sugar. There are diseases that are beyond ke the ketogenic diet. But you are making a difference. You're at least taking out what you can control from that environment and what you can't control is left. And you can manage what you can't control a lot better if you've taken out the other influences. So I applaud you for doing what you're doing. Um, and ultimately, what I tell my patients is this. Experiment with it. Have, be open-minded and experiment with various things. But from a stone perspective, add the fat, diminish the protein, and I think you should be okay. The problem is sourcing the fat. Yeah, and, and just a, a quick ray of hope, maybe. I don't know. What was the diet that your parents were eating when they got their It stone? was a very high protein. That, that my mom describes it as just my dad was just, they were only eating protein, that's what they were told. Yeah. Great answer. Anything? And, and that's what I, I feel like going carnivore is going to be, can be, could be really high. Pro, I mean, I, I assume I'll be satiated, satiated by all the, the, the fat I get also, but I'm thinking it, it's going to be a pretty high protein diet also, potentially. And, and so... Just one just comment. I, sorry, I, just, I don't like the word carnivore. I like the word whole animal. Okay. Um, again, be prepared to eat the organs. Be prepared to eat as much of the whole animal as you possibly can. Um, don't just think of it the muscles of the animals. The one published study I know of of a pure carnivore diet was in the Journal of Biological Chemistry in 1930. Um, by uh, two of the early captains of metabolic research in the United States, uh, Walter McClellan and Eugene Dubois. And they took two Arctic explorers and uh, basically locked them up in an insane asylum, Bellevue Hospital in New York City. 
uh, for five months, and once they got past the duration of time when they should have developed scurvy and didn't, they let them out, but had them report back in pretty much on a daily basis for a whole year. And they lived on nothing but animal products. Uh, and they were trying to recreate the macronutrients that they'd been consuming when living among the Inuit in the Arctic. Uh, and they basically ate nose to tail. Um, so they had brains, marrow, liver, kidney, um, uh, uh, meat, but the, and they analyzed precisely what the macronutrient composition was that they consumed, and here's my point. It was 85% fat and 15% protein. It was not a high protein diet. And these are people who learned from a society that spent, the modern Inuit had lived in the Arctic with that culture, we believe, for 1,800 years. So uh, they brought back with them, I'm hypothesizing, a, a highly distilled, sophisticated view of what the right nutrient mix should be, and it's not high protein. It's very high fat.